I guess I'll, I'll say it first. One of the things that I've understood is that like this is very much the beginning of like a lot more learning that I need to do. And also to that point, I think whenever we were discussing like reading this book, I think there within the past couple of months has been like some controversy around it and around the way it's framed. And I also think one thing I've heard a decent amount is like, don't read that book, read this book instead. And one of the things I find so interesting is like, why can we only, why is the bar at one book? I know. Why not read both? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought too. And that was like, I know I heard that too. And I was still like, Hey, what's up everyone? Can you hear me? Am I even recording? Is any sound going in here? I don't hear myself, but that doesn't mean maybe I need to adjust my input gain. How's that? Oh yeah, there we go. There we go. This one's coming out late. Uh, and not because of the controversial content, although maybe the content is controversial. Maybe this episode is going to be the one that gets me canceled or pulled or whatever. Um or exposes my ignorance. Uh, I will expose some ignorance for you right now. The reason is because of M4A files. I've read that when you're doing podcasts remotely, you should uh, record, we do them over Zoom, you record the Zoom audio, but they say to record a backup file on QuickTime and and, uh, it'll sound better. And now I'm starting to think that I've just been reading podcasting for dummies articles or something. Anyway, I'm trying to move away from using GarageBand for everything into something more professional. But what I found is that these M4A files recorded by QuickTime, I couldn't get them to open in anything else. I tried uh, opening them up in iTunes and converting. It's an Apple program. It should work, right? Uh, No dice. Wouldn't open. James's would. Mine wouldn't. Tried uh, opening them in VLC, converting, didn't work, Uh, wouldn't open in Ableton. I tried using a cloud converting software, that didn't work. Finally, I discovered that Audacity would do the trick. So here we are after much deliberation. I just want this to sound good for you. Uh, So this is me and my brother talking about the book White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Uh, we are, we thought it'd be just good to self-educate. To that end, I'm going to post a whole bunch of resources in the show notes for this episode at learndrums.ca. Uh, this is raw and uncut Joe Rogan style. There is one cut where we take a bathroom break, but that certainly wouldn't upset a Joe Rogan fan, would it? If you know, you know. Anyway, I'm almost out of time. You didn't come here to listen to this anyway. Here we are, me and my brother James Brown taking on White Fragility. Is this going? Oh, now it is. Now that we're recording, Micah is just going to use it from wherever I hit record. Oh, Oh, yeah. he's, uh, He's producing now. Yeah, if he, I mean, this one, I'm trying to turn around on too short notice, so I don't feel right asking somebody else to uh, do that for me. But if he wants to do it up tomorrow, he's free to do. So, are you okay with this coming out like in two days? Yeah, whenever. I'm ready. Let's let it roll. So I went. I went a different route. Uh, you familiar? Lamb spice rum, and they have a special edition bottle right now. With a snake on it. Wow. A, co- That's cool. a cool snake, I would add. Don't go for them. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. it was about time. You know, the only place I've ever seen that is the O'Leary PEI liquor store. Um, and they had it, and it's the second time I've bought it, and both times it's been on sale. It's been like $26. Both times it's been in O'Leary? Yep. Wow. And it's like the the stock at the liquor store has been like i've gone in there looking for um you know i don't want to pay 16 dollars for four beers necessarily because yeah. it's like a party but i don't want to pay like 25 dollars for 
12 Labatt Blue or something. Or I don't want to pay like eighteen ninety nine for eight Labatt Blue. Yeah. Um, so the twenty six dollars snake rum really uh, is, is the sweet spot. <laughs> that's the ticket, eh? And it's the yeah. Spot. Uh, that's funny. That's what I've always found. There is like, it's weird that liquor does not really have a uh, increase in price compared to like the rest of Canada because beer is like double price. Yeah, it's so expensive. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, I just feel like I'm getting ripped off no matter what I get if I buy beer. Like, Yeah. Yeah. And you could pay twenty three forty nine for a James Ready. Yeah. But then it's like, I've got 12 James Ready that I don't really want to drink. No. You know, they're just cheap. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, uh, it is what it is. Yeah. In New Brunswick, it also, I mean, you could call this rationalizing too, but... Um, you can get 24 of whatever like macro brew beer for uh-huh. thirty six ninety nine. So why would you ever buy less than 24? You get that, yeah, totally. You get that every time. That's what I would do. Yeah, because it's $30 for 15 or $37 for 24. Yeah, you're an idiot not to get 24. Yeah, it must literally. be rough on all the things that like don't aren't a part of that deal or don't come in that format because it's just like, I imagine everyone who walks in the liquor store has the same conundrum. Well, it's either, I mean, there's also like a million kind of craft options Mm -hmm. too. And White Claw has entered the market here now. Oh yeah. Was that embraced? Yes. Yeah. Heartily, I would say. Oh, it's been embraced in my household anyway. (laughs) Never had a White Claw. But I have had like hard seltzer before, and it's funny how it's like, it's just soda water and booze. Yep. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I guess it's great, but at the same time, it's like, it's funny that you put it in a can and it becomes like uh, interesting. You put, yeah, well, you put I a think little, the branding like, too. Brand to it. Yeah. Like it's it's got a good name and a good logo, and the cans are even like, I think the size and shape of them plays into it. Mm hmm. And then it's like, you know, it's pleasant, but I would say the biggest, um, its biggest appeal is that it is easy to drink. Yeah, totally. And it's low calorie. Yeah. But still gets you wasted. (laughs) Low calorie is something I feel like I should care about, but I don't. Yeah, I I don't necessarily think you should. Especially when you're drinking, it's like, it inherently cannot be a low calorie endeavor. Like right, alcohol sure. is just caloric, quite caloric. Right. So it's like you're reducing things by, you know, 10 to 20 percent. But it's like if you really give a shit, just like don't be a moderately functioning alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't drink or don't drink so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Having one less drink would do the exact same thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, I got you. It's like I was talking to somebody the other day who just had worked in coffee shops and they're saying they're always baffled by the people who would come in and get like a kind of a non-dairy latte with extra whipped cream. Mm-hmm. Which like what you, you know what the whipped cream is made of, right? Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> No, I don't. Just the answer. No. <laughs> yeah. Or even like, you know, like a skim milk latte with extra whip. Yeah. Oh my god! But I'm not a latte guy myself. <laughs> anyway, cappuccinos I'll do. Cortados, even a flat white here and there. I need Lattes to um, too much. I need to respond to my landlord real quick. Is that okay? Mm. Like on a text message. Okay, I assume it's okay. Make it snappy. Yeah. <laughs> I just mean like make it a snappy retort. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Whatever you want, you fuck up. <laughs> now he's um renovating our apartment. So it's like he's con- there's constantly things on the go and like stuff to be the um, he's, he's really funny because 
I feel like he just doesn't operate the way I would expect someone to operate. And it's like, he's a landlord, which is whatever. There's always going to be like a weird relationship with that. Um, but also it's like, he does want to be a very nice guy, but also it's like the way, the way he sort of pitches things to us or tells us about things is very strange. Like one day, like a week and a half ago, he asked like, um, are you guys planning on like keeping all your appliances? Because here too, you own your appliances. Um, in apartments, they don't really furnish them or anything. So like stove, like would you have had to stove, it fridge? In? Yeah. And what happens is everywhere you go, it's just like you essentially pay the old people like three hundred dollars, and they just right. keep all that stuff because it's like no one's gonna move that shit. Yeah. But um, he asked if we wanted if we were gonna keep all that stuff, and it was like. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think we are. And then a few nights later, he sends us a text message like past 10 p.m. on like a Thursday. Being like, hi, guys, what we can offer you is like, um, if you guys want to get all new appliances, uh, we can like um, put most of the money and um, like you will own them. And if you guys give a contribution of $1,200, and he sends us like all this, all these like new appliances that he's like, here's what we would buy. And it's like, it is like $3,000 worth of stuff. But it's also like, why the fuck do you think I have $1,200 to spend on like a fridge? Especially a new work. appliances when you already said you were planning on keeping the ones you have. <laughs> it's just so weird. It's so weird. And also literally today, um, we were, because it's like, so they've been doing active work in our apartment this whole time and the apartment right beside us was vacant so we just got moved into here temporarily while they do work but um, he doesn't he didn't have a key to our place and he was never like can i take a key and like go make a copy or something like that um so we had just been like letting him or letting like contractors in every day we'll just like wake up open the place up close it at night but today he texted us being like hey can you open it up? Like, I want to go do some more. <laughs> we're like, we're away for a few hours. You know, we could do it later or, you know, sorry. Um, and then he just says, okay. And then <laughs> about two hours later, I get a text. It's a photo. And he says, I left you a key uh, by the door frame. And I was confused. And I asked, like, is this to our front door? And he goes, yeah. And I was just confused. But I thought, okay. And then... <laughs> I get home today. The, the whole lock has been changed. He like he, See, your own apartment. My apartment. <laughs> he couldn't get in, and I guess I don't even know what he wanted to do. I looked in. I didn't notice any work having been done. But it's like he couldn't get in, and because he had neglected two hours. Yeah, because he had neglected to like have a key to this apartment from the get-go or to actually do any work to like make a copy of the key or something yeah um at a cost of three to to four dollars get a locksmith to come and replace the whole lock Weird. Maybe there are more copies of your key floating around than you know. <laughs> there was a, yeah, this is a different story that I'll have to tell you one day, but there was a like situation um, last year where the apartment that I'm currently in, like the temporary apartment, essentially squatters took it over last year. So there was like a security breach and uh, there were people like squatting here. For months. The place where you live right now? Yeah, the, the unit that I'm in currently. <laughs> wow. How does that happen? <laughs> it was so... Uh, there's the, the shortest version of it is our neighbor was... Um, we had this neighbor who had like always been... Had always had cancer, essentially, as long as I've been here, which is a bit over three years. Um, and she was probably like 40 or something, chain smoker. Um, and she had cancer. And then it seemed like around this time last year, or a bit more than a year ago, it seemed to be getting worse. You saw her like walking with a cane and stuff. And then there were these two people who were like, 
I had assumed hired help or something like that. And then um, because she just like couldn't take, needed help essentially. Um, and then one day like she just was gone. And I look out my front door and it's like my landlord and another person like arguing with one of the helpers being like, you can't stay here. <laughs> and they're like, no, this is like where I live now. And it was like, and then that that was also from our perspective totally fine and this person just stayed and they like went to try and go through the course to get them evicted but then winter was coming on so it's you can't really evict people here in the winter which is honestly mm. a great law um but um over time it got like worse and worse and worse and just like more people started coming into the apartment to a point where it's like it's like there were always like eight to twelve people in the unit and it did not seem like wholesome things were going on there. So I, right. I, so I guess there is like some impetus, but at the same time, it's like I don't think they had our keys. Right. Yeah. 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 Weird. Yeah. What are they having in the whole building or what? I don't know. Yeah. That's speculation on my part. I think he just wanted to get in. Yeah. And I think he yeah. too was like. One, I just want to do whatever I'm going to do today. And also it's like, <laughs> this way I won't have to like get them to make me a key or something or have to like borrow their keys so I can get a copy made. I think in his mind, it was two birds with one stone. Yeah. Didn't have to deal with that. Just like update the whole thing. <laughs> update the whole thing. But I was like, shocked. <laughs> it's so strange. Yeah, well, weird when it's like your own home, too. <laughs> There's someone who changed the locks. But my thing with that, he didn't even say, like, hey, I changed the locks. Here's a new key. He just said, here's a key to your house. Yeah, because you can't get in anymore. Because <laughs> I am now the only person with keys to your house. Right. <laughs> I know You're that welcome. was previously only you, and that was the issue, and now, now it's only me. <laughs> but soon it will be both of us, so this all will have been <laughs> worthwhile. <laughs> it's quite a quite a move. I've never seen it done before. <laughs> <laughs> and that's I just feel like this guy has some moves that I've never heard of before. <laughs> and it's not even like it's malicious or anything, but it's just like what like what environment did you grow up in or like what what do the people around you do? <laughs> <laughs> that make that makes this a normal course of action. Yeah. No, but uh, it is what it is. Mm. All right, so um, we got a job to do. Mm -hmm. We are the guys to take on this complicated <laughs> subject. Mm -hmm. Speaking of what environment did you grow up in and what do the people around you do? Excellent segue. Um, we are here to talk about um, the book um, called White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. I'm joined by my brother, James Brown. He's Hello. holding the book up to the screen. <laughs> yeah, um, I read the whole thing. He claims to have read the whole thing. Yeah. Um, James Brown, why have we chosen this book? Um, it seemed like it's sort of the one. It's the one that I heard tossed around the most. Um, it's mm -hmm. also sort of the. I remember hearing about this book a few years ago, and it seems like it's made the rounds a little bit. It seems like it's talked about pretty frequently. Uh, sometimes to varying degrees of, uh, like, I feel like I've often heard people talk about this book and I don't believe that they have read the book. Right. <laughs> and also it's like, it is, it seemed like a good gateway into like trying to understand how race relates to me a little bit and like my role within, uh, the larger issue of racism. Yeah, Totally. Um, yeah, and so for the reader, we have been kind of, or the reader, wow. Uh, I've been listening to it in audiobook form, and they talk about the reader, and here I am just parroting <laughs> what I heard. <laughs> You're quoting. Yeah, yeah, I am quoting. 
When I say the reader, I'm quoting. <laughs> um, yeah, we were talking about doing um, a podcast, and I think this was at the time when I was doing the like live stream video show because every everybody was still quarantined, mm -hmm. um, which I should have started sooner, but um, ended up only lasting three episodes. But I could see it coming back once you then became like. Things lo restrictions loosened up here. Everybody had been shut indoors for a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, it was starting to get warmer, um, in, like lighter out later. So all of a sudden, staying in and talking to my computer on Saturday night was uh, less exciting and also less like, you know, you want it to be for somebody. Totally. Well, it's like I, I remember when you did it with Micah. Uh, yeah. I remember like staying in and watching that and feeling like this is an okay thing to do on my Saturday night. It's like, this makes sense. And also what else am I going to do? And now it's like, exactly. I don't know if I'd catch it. No, I mean, that was the point of the show. And for me too, it was like, I don't want to be necessarily committed to staying home. Like now that Every I can Saturday. finally go out. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing it's like, do you remember phoning people? How we did that for like two months. Yeah. And then it just it got nice. Up. It's like, okay, see you never. Oh, I know. It just kind of fell off the map. We also would play Quiplash with my friend Liam like on Friday nights. Uh -huh. And then I bet, I bet it went away and no one even addressed it. Um, there was a week, there was like one week where there was a message that went around, like anybody up to play or are we done? Is, like, is that part of our lives over now? <laughs> <laughs> and it was a great, like, it was a good thing while, while it was going on. And I could see if we head into a, um, st state pandemic stage two, where are they calling it? Second wave. Second wave. Yeah. Oh, Dude, this is this is a total aside, but so I've been doing. Uh, this week was Fundy Fringe Fest uh -huh. here in St. John, and so my friend Joe and I put a show together. And really, like she had been asked to do it by the organizers because, um, normally they have people from all over coming to play this thing, and um, the way the fringe festivals work, I didn't know this. It's a lottery, so you apply. And everybody gets an equal chance to get in. Yeah, they're basically drawing at random. Mahali would know about this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I've, uh, I know the system a little bit. Okay, I didn't because I've attended quite a few, and Mahali has been in several friend shows. I've seen yeah. some incredible ones and some that I wish I could like get my time back. That's how I felt too. Like some really cool and some pretty bad. Yeah, which is the good and the bad of the lottery system. Yeah, totally. But so anyway, in this case, of course, nobody can come from at the time, like outside of New Brunswick. Uh -huh. um, so the pool of available people to play this thing is much smaller, but they still wanted to put it on and maybe it's going to be a virtual thing because for the organizers too, it's a once a year event. Totally. Um, and also, there's no other events going on. There's nothing else for you to organize. And yeah, like, exactly. you're in a place where you just don't have that many cases too. And there's no one going in or out. So it's like, it's not like we have to sit here and do nothing forever. Yeah, exactly. I know you're, you're like, we, we have to act responsibly to manage the situation. But yeah, and so even in this case, like a lot of the shows were online. Mm -hmm. We did ours outdoor, outdoors in a park. Mm -hmm. um, and And there were some that happened live, but because of, it like the audience is capped at thirty people in a room that would normally hold just over a hundred um, to keep the the social distancing totally. intact. Um, and so anyway, a lot of stuff just didn't happen, and so there were a few shows, um, but we wound up doing one in a park. And so Joe was asked to put something together just so they would have material for the festival. Mm -hmm. I think is is how it happened. Maybe I'm like. I know maybe we got a sweet deal and like bypassed the lottery system and I shouldn't be saying that, but um, we're dying for that slot. Yeah. Um, in any case, yeah, it was a much smaller thing this year and we did, it was a puppet show. So I did the music and she did the story. So it was like a brother's grim story that uh, was 
turned into a puppet show. She made puppets. She's like a theater tech person. Mm-hmm. And um, I played guitar and harmonica and did all the like soundtrack for oh. it. Um, but anyhow, yesterday was our final show. And uh, there was a rally protesting um, like Bill Gates, human trafficking, mandatory vaccines. Finally, um, someone's sticking up for all those things, eh? Spineless politicians. Yeah, uh, it's about <laughs> it's about time that some that anyone stand up and say, "Hey, let's stop human trafficking." Like a yeah, really right. brave He's- position that these people are taking. Yeah, to just to come out and say it in public too. Yeah, to- totally, totally. It's like really revolutionary, and that's why. I mean, and to, <laughs> I don't know. It's so funny to lump Bill Gates and mandatory vaccines and human trafficking all within one. Uh, that's one what I thought. Category. It seems like those are all quite separate issues. I guess I get, I understand the connection of Bill Gates and vaccines. And then the, the human, it seems like human trafficking is important enough that it should have its own protest. Sure. If you're, if you're really going to try and fight for something, don't Bill Gates shouldn't like tack on to the human trafficking one. Yeah, because I don't necessarily see the connection there unless, like, I know that certainly um, there have been celebrities and influential people connected to Jeffrey Epstein, and mm-hmm. so there is that. I don't know that Bill Gates is one of them. Maybe he was. I feel like he... Well, I, I, and I shouldn't uh, float because I, I don't know. I haven't heard that he was. I feel like if no, he, he doesn't was, seem like a party guy to me. By now, he's too famous. He also, seems like too much of a nerd to be like in. That's that what group. I thought. Um, yeah. And also, it's like <laughs> there's a lot of people who are connected to that, and you can you could go after them if you like. <laughs> Probably the president that you really love, like he was connected to. That. Yeah, very like pretty visibly connected. <laughs> yeah. And he yeah. all all he had to say to um, just Lynn Maxwell was to wish her well. So um, yeah, but, but and, we're st- we're doing what we can to fight against these issues. Which I mean, that's sort of, and it's I guess it's I I can't help but like joke about sort of the way that these people, or that people in general, um, like co-opt these sort of um, these issues and make it make it a big deal because it's like I care about it in this context and I care about like human trafficking in the sense that I can lump Bill Gates and mandatory vaccines in with it and like yeah, it's all of emergency part of also and your conspiracy that I'm against but also and the like, media I feel like it's like a it totally relates to what we have been reading about in this book which is just like white people's tendency to take an issue like racism and decide what the issue is. Sure. Yeah. Well, cause this was the, so I, in you're right. Like, and this was the, the, the connection that I was going to make, um, is that I went and I had some time before the show started. So I thought I'd go hang out at the edge of the demonstration seat. Mm-hmm. Like number one, we had to ask them to move because we had like <laughs> French festival had applied for a permit to use this space. And that's exactly where they were. Uh-huh. And they're it, like, it, you know, it's totally allowed. They have freedom of assembly and it's a public park yeah. and blah, blah, blah. But we had a permit to use this one section of it. And so, yeah, they had, to, they had to move. They moved. You um, made them move. They did move. <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were moving when I got there. I had like I saw them starting to. I was like, oh god, did we do that? Um, That's great. Honestly, you did a public service. Well, it's fine. They just went to they. You know, they just went to the other side of the park. Yeah. Um, but I, anyway, I went to listen a little bit, and this guy was talking about um, Bill. I want to say Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation ran a simulation at John Hopkins University. And did, this you added air quotes. Was that his air quotes, or did you, is that your own? Uh, uh, they were my own okay. uh, because it's Johns Hopkins <laughs> University. <laughs> I see. I see. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so I mean, you know, just if we're gonna be exposing the truth here, I just think we want to be consistent. <laughs> Maybe um, we can get the basic facts straight. Well, it's funny that like an idiot like me who was not clued in would pick up on that. But anyhow, they, they said they ran this simulation about a pandemic and they did it a few years ago. The video is a must watch. It's three or four hours long. And uh, oh, my God, did they say that or did you research the video after? No, that's what he said. Oh, my God. And and then was like. Um, you know, and then they said, and they ran, and they thought what would happen, and you know, the governments of the world were overwhelmed, and they thought they could contain it, but then they couldn't, and then the health systems were overrun, and people stro- stopped trusting the news, they stopped trusting the media, uh-huh. and there were riots. Doesn't that sound like what's going on in the world right now? Uh-huh. It's not a coincidence. And so you are going to take protests over you know is sparked by like definitely the fact that everybody was like shut down because of coronavirus led to increased attention Mm -hmm. but you know like protests sparked by the killing of george floyd and by the police and um exacerbated by and now i'm gonna sound like a conspiracy theorist but like inside operators smashing shit yeah you know spurred on by those people and you are going to blame that on bill gates Mm -hmm. like so you are going to take all of the racism and the legitimate grievance against it and all the peaceful protests too because that's the other side of the stories you want to talk about riots sure there's that side of it there are people whose actual anger is uh, manifesting there's you know riot uh, riots are the language of the unheard there are also people who are smashing stuff to make protesters look bad but mm-hmm. then there are all of the peaceful protesters which- oh they're just it's like it's literally um well it's just it's it's frustrating to see the attention that like troublemakers get compared to the attention that like a gathering of say 50,000 people um, right. does not get her because it's like I attended um, a protest here in Montreal and there was probably like 30, 40,000 people. Um, after I, I like went and like sort of was there and was present for like an hour and then it was scheduled to end at like six or 7 PM. So I feel like I say it was scheduled to end at six. I probably left at like five forty-five. Um, as I was walking up away, probably a few, few blocks down the road, saw just there was a light cycle and all the cars were about to go. This was on Saint Laurent in um, in Montreal, the corner of Saint Laurent and Sherbrooke, like one of the busiest corners in the city. But it's like the light cycle was completely stopped abruptly by um, vans and vans and vans of police officers not vans like like small buses of police officers probably like five or six buses of you know the riot squad that was they had to go on the red line because it was it was real it was a big emergency that they had to get there to go to a protest that has been entirely peaceful um and then i saw later that like people continued to be there like into 7, 8 p.m. I think at around 7 or 8, the police declared that it was an unlawful gathering. Um, But people stuck around because it's like, this is what we came here to do. We came here to peacefully disrupt in a way, or it's like some people came to peacefully disrupt, which is a totally valid form of criticism over... um, even exterior to the larger context, systematic racism that has been studied and uh, proven to exist by the SPVM, um, the Montreal's police force. And then there was a moment where, because we had seen like videos from around the continent of sort of like police forces kneeling or some police, especially like the the uh, act of solidarity of like police choosing to kneel rather than um, rather than 
react violently to things. And it's like that was sort of pushed as like a feel good moment within the past week when we were seeing like images of so many protests and also seeing a lot of images of riots and stuff. The police yeah. um, had formed a large line at this point. They all started kneeling down. The protesters started like clapping and were like really appreciative of the thing. And then you see they're not kneeling down out of solidarity. They're kneeling down to put gas masks on and they start gassing. They start tear gassing all of the people who have, um, who are still there. So then you just have people running around. And then after that occurred, there was like windows smashed and things like that. And it was like when I watched it on CBC News that night, what I saw was people looting Steve's music store. That, I was going to say, that's the only thing that I heard about it yeah. was Steve's music, like Windows Smash guitars getting stolen. You didn't hear about 40,000, 50,000 people like in the streets all peacefully trying to communicate a message. No. You also didn't hear about uh, two to 3,000 peaceful protesters being tear gassed by their own, uh, by their own police forces while they are protesting police brutality. No. And you also didn't hear like the guy from Steve's music afterwards when he's asked about it saying like, those are just guitars. Like there's a big uh, that I did that, hear. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was cool of him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was, that was cool too. And it's just like, it's so poignant, right? It's like, why? And this is a, a question that's not just rhetorical. I feel like it's like, we have to ask ourselves this all the time. It's like, why? do we believe that like the actions of, you know, 40,000 people, the peaceful actions can be defined by the, like uh, the somewhat violent actions of say a hundred people. And also why then are the actions of police not judged in the same way where it's like, if, if we're going to, I mean, if, if, if a protest is going to be judged by looting and that and it's seen as bad, then necessarily you have to see the police as bad because there has been violence incited by them unnecessarily even on that day. Yeah. I don't know why. Like I don't know I don't know whose benefit it would be in to push that kind of a narrative, particularly with CBC. It would be something else if it's like a privately owned media company, mm -hmm. you could understand them having an agenda. I don't know why CBC would focus on something like that other than to get attention, but I don't know. I mean, I haven't... You know. I mean, it's still, though, I think the thing with CBC is like they still, even though they're publicly funded, they're not exterior to capitalism, essentially. And it's like they still do have to justify their uh, existence and their funding is at stake every year essentially it's not like we have like a permanent uh funding model for them no so it's like i feel like because i i've all like throughout the past several months i think I, I have not been particularly impressed with like cbc's coverage of a number of things and like i always had really appreciated the way they would bring nuance to subjects sometimes and I think they're still like okay but I feel like it's just been I guess just partaking in large gatherings like that too which is something that I hadn't really done until like the past uh, year or so is like it just gives such a a uh, uh, it helped me realize like how from a media perspective what they're looking for is storylines and it's like peaceful protest is an awful storyline. Yeah, it's not. But the thing is, like, it sounds uninteresting in the sense of like nothing happened. Yeah. But if you get a picture of that, it's so powerful. Anytime I've seen a picture or a video, yeah. it's amazing. Totally. It's like more powerful than a couple of guitars getting stolen. Right. So I don't know why. Like, but maybe that doesn't serve anyone's interests. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. But it's just strange and it's like so and i mean it's like i'm sitting here frustrated about that um that's a very mild form of like what what people of color have to deal with you know every day or consistently where it's like 
I got one insight into like a moment where it's like the the narrative around the actions that took place and the actions that actually took place seemed totally distorted and it seemed yeah. somewhat based upon a lot of people's predisposed notions that it's like a protest of this size should be violent and especially the police's predisposed notions that a protest this size should be violent because they straight up brought violence to it well and i think it is and it's you know it's, it's something we've seen a lot of discussion about but it i think is also like if you are trained to operate in a certain way that's how you know how to operate yeah so yeah. when you show up you're like well i don't know what else to do we're supposed to make these people move so let's make a move totally. <laughs> the tear gas and like that's all we know totally yeah no and it's like it's so weird that there's not it's like what i do wonder what is a good answer to the question like why can't they just stand there though like i don't know and especially when they're standing there with purpose and it's like if you weren't perpetrating a system of violence then people wouldn't even be standing there wouldn't exist preventable yeah. i know i saw a good quip that's like um you know people are talking about police like they're just doing their jobs and if that's all that was happening nobody would be upset there's no song called fuck the fire department yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny it's true yeah totally 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 yeah because it's i don't know i don't know it's a lot but it's like also yeah i guess um it's easy too for us though as white people to get like frustrated with things and issues that we can understand but it's like i understand how the police's actions are bad but it's like the what reading this book is sort of brought to my attention and it's something that I've been you know trying to learn more to throughout the past several months though is like the ways in which you know forget about the police and forget about um not forget about systematic racism like understand it but I feel like what a, a, a big part of the utility of this book in particular is just like start to reflect and take action upon like how you and your life are uh, complicit i guess or are not trying to actively challenge and um, the the institution of racism right yes so let's um we'll, we'll bring people up to speed a little bit um i will maybe i'll give my, my summary and um you can you you can uh, correct me or <laughs> fill in the blanks or you know what I mean. I didn't want to be like I'm going to explain everything and then you can say your little piece too. No, um, no but I would say so. Uh, number one thing is that the book is explicitly aimed at. So first of all, the author is a white woman, mm -hmm. Robin D'Angelo. She's an anti-racist educator, university professor. Um, uh, apparently spends most of her time and makes most of her living doing diversity training workshops. Mm -hmm. I like uh, currently and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so going to, um, corporations, maybe corporate environments, um, trying to help them understand how systemic racism might be affected. And basically why the work environments are so white a lot of the time, mm -hmm. how racism might be showing up in the workplace. And so the book is uh, written by a white person and aimed at white people. Um, I can't remember if she says it's also ex aimed explicitly at progressive white people. I don't remember that part. I don't remember her specifically saying. I feel like also the ethos of the book is like it's aimed at all white people for sure i think she does at points like speak to progressive white people and especially the traps that white people who see themselves as progressive will fall into because it's like progressiveness can lead you to patting yourself on the back and feeling like you have less blind spots but i don't totally. think it's specifically end up that no right and so that's something that i found myself like it's something that i found myself falling into 
throughout. Mm-hmm. Um, in, and you know, it's like how deep a philosophical level you want to get with it, but it's like it really is an ego thing where it's like, you know, you can hear where they describe a scenario and like people reacting a certain way. And I'm like, well, I wouldn't do that. I'm smarter than that, you know, and then you get to feel good about yourself. Um, But that's not, you're not really solving any problem. You're just like, you're always looking to exempt yourself, which I certainly uh, would love to do because it's uncomfortable. Really? And Um, I had, I had a similar experience reading it at a certain point. So so, yeah, especially like feeling like, well, I'm sort of proud that I seem to be like further along in the process than, you know, the target demographic of this thing. And like, look at me, pat myself on the back for being like, I'm less racist than these people. When it's like, yeah. and that's why too, I had read the original like article that this book is based off of um, a few months ago. And I found it like very helpful in terms of like just understanding, I guess, the concept of, white fragility which we should explain in a minute but it's like um and i i remember at points of reading the book and being like i feel like this is maybe like i would get more out of it if i was like less far along in my journey of understanding and then it's like i feel like that's the reason why i had to read this entire book from this lady for her to just like tell me like 14 times like stop saying that (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> because it's like you can read an article and feel like, oh, I spent an afternoon like studying this thing. So good for me. But it's like it, I had to hear it day after day. Like this response that you're having is just not helpful. Right. Yes. Yeah, so that's a, okay. So, um, so to further summarize, um, the case that she makes in the book is that we have inherited a racist system. Uh, built on racial inequality. And uh, and another reason we get to pat ourselves on the back is that we are in Canada. Uh, mm-hmm. The book references the U.S. And, and so the author talks about, and I mean, this certainly, certainly exists in our own country, how the United States uh, is a country based on, professes to be, built on the idea that, you know, all men are created equal. And look, first of all, it's all men. Um, but, you know, from the get-go was built on uh, genocide and dispossession of indigenous peoples. And then uh, also annexing parts of Mexico. And then importing slaves from Africa. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, the country wouldn't exist without stolen land and genocide. The economy wouldn't exist without slave labor. And, oh, yeah, the other part of it wouldn't exist without, like, uh, killing and stealing parts of Mexico. Yeah. And so she says that the people who came over, though they might may have seen themselves as rejecting the the British model or the European model of governments and the, the hierarchies there, um, they had deeply internalized patterns of behavior that they just brought over to a new place and perpetuated. And this was an interesting idea for me. We went to Scotland a few years ago and I remember going, well, we visit a few different castles and um, because some of these buildings have been around for so long, but I remember we go, uh, going to this one, uh, Aelin Don, and which is... Um, near the Isle of Skye, and it's where mm-hmm. Highlander was shot, apparently. My mm-hmm. optometrist in Halifax um, said we should go there because it was like I was telling him, kind of describing the Red Mirror trip, and he's like, oh, and it's like intact. They've really preserved it. So anyway, you go there, and it's like, you know, from 1300 to 1340, this clan owned it, and then this other clan showed up and killed them all, and then they lived here for a while, and then the other clan showed up and killed them all, and they owned it for a while. So it's like essentially this big, nice home that people like families are killing each other over so that they can live there. Yeah. I mean, and that's really a stupid like simplification of the power dynamics. But it, what it really illustrated to me is like, no wonder that's what they did when they came over here. Because that's yeah. what they did. Totally. Totally. They saw a place they wanted killed whoever was living there and took it for themselves. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it's like, and it's like, 
I think there's this um, this tendency in the modern age to be like you can't judge against that, which I think is like in some ways it sort of makes sense, but at the same time it's like I don't know. We had "Thou shalt not kill" for thousands. <laughs> right? of years. Yeah, that's been around longer. <laughs> it's not like they were like. Should I really be doing this? Do you, is this okay? It's like, no. You know when you're killing and stealing from other people that what you're doing is deeply moral. So it's like... Yeah, you it know you get upset of, if it's done to you. Yeah. And it's one thing to say that it's like, it's the way that things are already do- have always been done. And it's another thing to like celebrate Columbus Day every year and be like, yeah, we built something great. Because it's like... <laughs> if your system is built on immorality, then it can't be uh, like a pure system. And you have well, to no, exactly. the giant flaws within it. Yeah. And also I, I find it like, that's a funny one for a couple of reasons. Like number one saying like, we did this, like how are you taking credit for something that happened hundreds of years before you were sure. born? You know, like you're like identifying with like, all you did was, you know, be born there yeah or (laughs) or maybe move there um but and then the other thing is obviously like all the stuff you have to overlook in order to to celebrate that thing uh but so anyway to to fast forward a little bit the 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 thrust of the argument as i took it in the book was that because we have an inherited and uh been brought up and socialized in a racist system also, very important to note that the author defines racism as a system of widespread oppression rather than something that an individual person is. And what I was thinking of it is like it's the difference between something that is racist and someone who is a racist. Totally, totally. Um, we tend to think of it as like a person being a racist and you don't want to be that. Mm-hmm. Rather than something that occurs every day and that you can't avoid partaking in because the society that we live in is racist and always has been racist. And racism is less so something that you are and it's more so an act that you will perpetuate, not even can perpetuate, but like as a white person, will perpetuate to some extent throughout your entire life. Right. Now that is that what you just said is an argument found throughout the book and is also a controversial statement according to uh, a few critiques of the the book that I've read. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you care to elaborate or qualify that statement or explain it for the listener? Why is it that as a white person, you, how can you assume that I will go forth and uh, perpetuate the system and, do bad things well i think why, um, why why do you think i'm a bad person one thing that i want to clarify first because i'd say something that was missing from uh how you said she describes racism um, yeah. is the idea too that it's based on a power dynamic and it's based less on like so there is um there's prejudice and mm-hmm. discrimination and white people can both experience prejudice and discrimination but white people can experience racism and that seems to, that's a like complicated thing to try and comprehend. And I right. a lot of people would push back. When I first heard about that idea, I definitely pushed back against it because my idea of racism is discrimination based on race. And white yeah. people can experience discrimination based on race, but they cannot experience racism because racism is discrimination based on race in a context where you are able to, um, or like your group, essentially your racial group is able to dominate the other racial group. And it's like, right. Within North America, white people cannot be dominated. A white person could be dominated and a white person could have essentially their rights taken away by another group or something. But white people as a race, cannot be oppressed by another race in this place because we have control of all of the power. But other races can be oppressed by white people because, once again, white people have control of all of the power or the vast majority of the power. 
Exactly, and it, and it's like you know, and, and as soon as you say something like olive or or to make any kind of generalization, people will look for um, examples. What about AOC? What about Barack Obama? Yeah, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. What about the one black president working within a party of mostly white people? Yeah. Um, but so I guess sort of more to uh, the point that, or the question that you posed, which can you remind me again? What? Uh, Why do you think I'm a bad person? <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another thing that's discussed, but I think needs to be talked about too. But I think the question was more about. Um, the assumption that you will go on and perpetuate racism or do racism. Yes, you're right. I couldn't remember, honestly. Um, <laughs> and it's not because, well, especially it's not because you're a bad person. And racism is removed from being good or bad is like one of the premises of the book. Um, and it's because straight up you don't understand. We don't, as white people, we are so insulated from racism because it's like you and I both grew up in Prince Edward Island and I didn't really think about racism for most of my entire life. Well, yeah, because it, it is a fun, it is something that, you know, I in the last few years have caught myself with where, where I kind of I always sort of you always know, like you're aware that white people came from Europe. We know vaguely the history of I read Canada, a but history of the United States and thought of myself as a progressive. Oh man, I took social studies in junior high in French uh, with a teacher who was pretty checked out and <laughs> retained basically nothing. Um, and that's really my understanding of you know Canada outside of any anything I've read on my own. Um, but my thing that I also always thought was like, yeah, but I'm from PEI and like PEI is like pretty much all white people. It's not entirely white, but it's like mostly white people. But then you guys step back and be like, why is PEI full of white people? Totally. And then like, also, how did that happen? I was also thinking because, uh, or also it's like PEI is also not entirely white people where we do have a pretty large indigenous population. We grew up 40 minutes from like, a uh, an indigenous reservation and it's like yep. i didn't know anyone i knew people from all over the island i knew no one from any of the reservation or anything. no i didn't either and you knew it existed and people it, will also i feel like because even i was thinking about this today i thought about i thought about that point and then i thought about well that's though because it's like their culture is a little bit insular. It's like they keep to themselves. They have their reserve. They don't really want you on the reserve and they, they want to have their own thing. And it's like, well, no, what, and I, I can't speak to what they wanted, but I do know this, like indigenous tribes in Canada did not want to move to reserves. No. Like we put them there or white people put them there. And so it's like, it's not even, even if everyone who lives on that reserve said, like, we don't want anything to do with white people anymore. Like, we're not going to talk to you. It's like, you're still not innocent within that thing. When it's like, essentially your ancestors that the, were the ones that are like, you live here now. Yeah, exactly. And, and we still operate, uh, w you know, in the society and the economy that were imposed mm -hmm. totally and that's why i'm doing okay in many ways they're like that's why i you know i and i guess i don't know so um but that was a that was a learning moment as i was reading this book because i definitely like exemption from race based on not being around people of color is something that I have identified with a fair amount throughout my life because I always felt like I never had enough of an opportunity to get yeah. to know people of color. But it's like, and you can, in a space like uh, most of the Maritimes where it's very white, it's like, I don't think that's an entirely unjust thing to say, but it's like, you can't just stop there you do need to like then go on to say, well, like, why is that? 
was this always a white space or did something happen that displaced all of the people of color? Yeah, right. Was this Which... designed white, white space? Was it designed to be white? And then it's like, if it if white people came and took it and said, no one can be not white here. And then a hundred years later, I'm like, well, I didn't have a chance. It's, everyone's white. It's not my fault. It's like, but if you don't consider what occurred, then yeah, because it, it, it was deliberately no created. Way. Like you, you need to reflect on the larger context of the land on which you live. Yep. Yeah, it didn't just naturally evolve that way. And you look at like, why is it called Prince Edward Island? That's yeah, totally. It's like no one who actually had claim to that land 400 years ago gave a shit about prince edward no who even now like i can't really tell you anything about prince edward no no, no. and it, it well and it yeah really speaks to the way things are done right it's like i don't even know if prince edward was a very noteworthy person but it was just like essentially the british being like ah oh, Here's a piece of shit slab of land somewhere far away. What if we name this after you? Wouldn't you like that, chap? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and then it's chap. like a total erasure of all of the people who live and exist there. It's a system in, imposed upon you. And it's like, it's, I don't know. So it's like, I, I, I guess what's important to recognize is that like, even though we live within a liberal democracy now, that is not what we evolved from. And that does not excuse what has occurred uh, specifically towards non-white people. And also it does not, um, and also if, if you are going to begin to understand the history of your place, specific to race then you also have to acknowledge that where you are evolved from the racial history of this space yes and like the absolutely world, your upbringing evolved from that it's like the attitudes of the people that you're surrounded by evolved from that yeah and what can happen too is you start to think, especially young people, because they just don't know any better. But it's like, um, you know, like privilege is a word that I actually don't like to use because it's like just so thrown around and people get like defensive. Yeah. Uh, but if you are born with any kind of privilege, especially as a young person, you think you earned it. You're like, you know, and like you see it all the time. I saw it all the time as a kid. It's like, oh, like gross you're poor you're dirty you know like that kind of thing totally. which is like okay what have you done to earn your lifestyle kid like nothing yeah totally. your parents bought you a super nintendo cool like yeah no exactly it's like you were born to advantage and how quickly we are how quickly you will gravitate towards believing that that is normal and okay, and also a sign of your own accomplishments. Yeah. And one thing that like, I feel like I need to learn more about and that this sort of made me a bit more curious about is like, is that natural in the slightest? Or are we essentially brought up in a uh, world in which you're essentially it's expected to constantly compare yourself to your neighbors and judge and essentially create a hierarchy of good and bad based on financial well-being, social status, things like that. And it's like, so it's like whenever a six or seven or eight year old kid, whenever like an eight year old kid says you're poor loser, it's yeah. like, is that human nature in the slightest? Or is he just absorbing the messages that we've been giving to that child? Yeah, I don't know. Because, yeah. 
<laughs> but I feel like that's one thing that this book made me more curious about. It's like, I had never thought about the intricate ways in which like kids are socialized to, um, to take on certain messages about like what's good and bad. And within the book, this is defined as white supremacy. And this was another big, like a big one that needs defining because whenever you say white supremacy, you think of the KKK, you think of um, uh, guys in the South with like a swastika on their kneecap or something like that. Yep. American history X. Uh huh. Exactly. And that's just as it's the question of racism versus the racist. It's yep. the question of, uh, white supremacy versus the white supremacist. So it's like, well, and I think a lot of it, sorry to interrupt as to say, I, I think a lot of it rests on how you interpret. Like, I think a couple of, um, things to be aware of when kind of grappling with this stuff is that number one, like we're talking about, everything is made up, including our language, our words, all of our social structures, all of it is made up and all of it didn't exist at some point. And Words exist to, you know, communicate concepts, but they're imperfect. That's why we have so many of them. Mm -hmm. And different words don't exist in different languages. Things are said differently. Um, so that's number one. So I know people do get hung up on, on certain words, and it can be a result of hearing something, interpreting it differently. Um, well, I mean, in a, even a, a recent example in Canada is whenever um, there was a um, study done on, uh, like a long-term study done on residential schools and uh, in a larger context, like residential schools, missing and murdered Aboriginal women, Canada's treatment of Aboriginal people in general throughout, especially from a federal government perspective, I remember whenever um, one particular report came out, it used the word genocide. And then you just had like weeks of like, not weeks, for the next several days, you could just like turn on the TV and it's just like some 55 year old white man saying like, well, we acknowledge the findings of the thing, the word genocide was, the use of the word genocide was inappropriate. And it's like that, is what we will cling to. We will and not only that, but if you look at the dictionary definition of the word genocide, that's what it was. Totally, totally. Like in this yeah. case, it yeah, exactly. was you're, appropriate. You just didn't like it. Yeah, exactly. No, totally. It's like you're, and I guess that's why it's so important to define terms and why it's like that's why I, I really, a part of the utility of this book was to, um, help to define terms for me in a way that I can understand whenever a term is used in like a more academic sense compared to what I had understood the term to be. Um, and that's yeah. like a real life case that happened in Canada pretty recently, where it's just like something can be so quickly derailed by a misunderstanding of the terms that are being used. And it's where it's like, it can go from a discussion of like, literal genocide to a discussion about what is the definition of genocide. Well, and not only that, but like they're trying to vilify us. They don't love our country. This is political correctness or, or whatever. Um, yeah. But, and so I would say that would fit the definition of, and I don't know that it would be white fragility, but maybe it would be as to, to described in this book. So, I'll, um, that's something we could get a around to defining now that we're that we're talking about words and what they mean. So, what is white fragility? Um, I would say white fragility is like a uh, a natural reaction that occurs whenever you, as a white person, feel racial discomfort because, as white people, we have not been forced to address the issue of race at many times. And we don't have essentially the muscles developed to talk about race in a nuanced way. So white fragility is essentially what occurs whenever someone says like, hey, what you did in this moment 
was, and let's put it really lightly, what you did here, the thing you said was racially insensitive. White fragility manifests itself when you respond like, oh, that's not what I meant. What I meant was this. Yeah, or, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I think, I think what you said is serious, but um, that's not what I meant. So, yeah, exactly. And so you try to let yourself off the hook. And it's, a, it's an inability to even deal with what they said, where it's like someone is bringing a point to you. And I'm certain they consider what you said as well. If someone took the time to like bring this up with you, um, but it's because it your, sucks for them. It's your assumption that it's like, oh, but that's what you're talking about is racism, and I'm not a racist. So therefore, my job now is to prove to you that I'm not racist. I feel like white fragility, when it manifests itself, for the most part. It is just um, someone trying to reassure the other person that they are not racist. Yeah, and reassure themselves too. Yeah. I think because my perspective on this, um, what I found, is I also think like in the context of the book, that would be white fragility because she's talking about um, this like kind of fragility being... Um, exhibited by white people in this context, but mm -hmm. where it seems familiar to me, it's like in addition to, you know, like recognizing those things from my own life, as somebody who teaches drum lessons, mm -hmm. adult males, and they tend to be white males because that's who tends to show up for my drum lessons, mm -hmm. they are the hardest ones to get to do anything. Mm -hmm because it's very difficult for them to take instruction. Mm -hmm. They need to admit that they don't know how to do something. If I tell them that what they're doing is wrong, but they're trying and they think it's good enough, they have a hard time accepting that they're doing the thing wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I get it with kids too. Kids are different, but it, it is something that I thought about reading this book. Like, in you know my job as a drum teacher or a teacher of music lessons, the hardest part of the job, and I would say the bigger part of the job than actually understanding and transmitting the information, is figuring out what is going on in this person's brain. Like, what are their defense mechanisms that I gotta work around in order to get them to practice this thing? Because no, it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be fun, and you're not going to be good at it at first. Yeah. And if you are brought up to believe that like you are good, so you will do well and you deserve to do well, then that's going to be really hard for you. Uh -huh. And especially bringing it back to like race and racism is like one advantage that you have as a, as a drum teacher is the person can sit down and be like, and at least they understand that I'm not actually good at playing the drums. But when it Sometimes. comes to something like racism, because it's like as white people, we've just, it's like, I never sat down and talked about what racism is with our parents. There's essentially this understanding that, and I don't even know too, if, and it's no knock on them, if our parents are were capable of like explaining that to a child in a like useful way beyond reaffirming that like just be good to people and everything will be okay. But what we're used yeah. to is the assumption that if you are a good person and if you are nice to people who don't look like you, you are doing your part to combat racism. But what we are learning, and it's about time, I guess, but it's like being a good person or thinking of yourself as a good person doesn't really do anything to combat racism because to combat racism, you have to talk about and think about and address and combat racism you can't ignore it away no and you can't and the other thing that and you know this does get addressed too is and it's it was even like my fear in doing this episode um certainly part of the reason that this book appealed to me as something to discuss rather than other ones that we we could have taken on 
is we are two white people. This is a white off author. Mm -hmm. It feels like a bit safer territory because what happens if somebody points their finger and says, you are racist? Yeah. And one of the things that I got and like I am appreciative of from this book, and I hope that I can take it and continue to have that be a part of my life, but it's like just if and when that happens, not going, no, I'm not. Don't don't say that. You know how dangerous that is to my reputation for you to say that? But instead to say like either could you if someone just says you're a racist, I guess it's like if that's all they say, it's like I guess that yeah, yeah, it's hard to argue with that. With what I, with what I understand about the topic from this point in time, it's hard to argue with someone saying you are racist. I don't think I can really make an argument that racism doesn't exist within me. If someone says this thing that you did at this particular point in time was a racist act, and if they like, if I feel like I understand what they said, I guess the appropriate response would to be like, thank you for taking the time to you know, say that and, and point that out. And like, I'm going to, I'm going to go with this now and like do some work around that blind spot in my life. Or if I like don't understand what they're saying, it's like reach out to the person or say like, hello, do you, do you want to talk about this first? Like, do you want to expand on what you said? And then if you do, it's like, could you please explain to me like what I did? And because the someone saying to you you are racist, it absolutely does feel like um, like a murder of your status. But it's well, like you need to get away from that idea because you are racist, right? And because like we only have the one idea of right, like so of the racist being and like let's be honest, like it's like the the redneck with the shotgun yeah. who's just gonna like shoot whoever shows up on his property like so it's you're like well i'm not that don't call me don't tell me i'm that or mm -hmm. or like you know the guys from american Hi history x or whatever mm -hmm. um and you feel like if if you are given that label then you're stuck with it for life and you're written off and, and also, thing, it is that, like you don't want anyone to find out because you can never come back from it. Totally, you can never come back from it. And two things that that made me think about. One is like one of the most useful things I found in this book and its discussion of racism and how white fragility manifests itself is on um, the idea of like the good bad, not conundrum. There's a different word used, but it's like the good bad dichotomy essentially, where it's like. To be not racist is good, to be racist is bad. Therefore, if you are accused of perpetuating racism in any way, it means that you are bad. And that yeah, is and our understanding. And so if someone says that what you did was racist, you need to, it's like you're put on trial and you need to prove, no, I'm not bad, I'm good. Actually, I'm good. And you fight with all of your life to be like, I'm good though. I'm good. I'm doing every like I I really think I'm good. I don't think I'm racist, but it's like when in reality it's more like racism is something that you were brought up in. It is a giant system of oppression of people of color. Um and in in many different forms for many different uh groups, but like it is white people imposing punishment upon non-white people in many scenarios and it is also the propping up of white people and putting ourselves first for hundreds and hundreds of years and how do you be a human being coming out of that or existing within that and not have any racism within you like being a good person does not mean that you lost this essentially evolution that occurred within white people to put ourselves first and to brush off the needs or uh, or words or uh, any any number of like attempted communications of like people of color 
Well, and also it's like you talk about, you know, um, people, I'm like way out of my depth on this, but like generational trauma, right? Uh -huh. You will actually inherit like uh, physical neurological structures mm -hmm. that recreate um, trauma that your parents experienced. So presumably we would inherit the same structures and thought patterns and whatever. And like, you know, how would they... Um, so if we are directly descended from people who cleared out a place, um, you know, killed or just displaced the people who lived there or just like let them die, mm -hmm. um, and took it over, if we are directly descended from that and no one has taken conscious steps to change those beliefs and views, how would they go away? Totally. If you don't change it, how does it go away? Because that's exactly what has occurred. No one has taken concrete steps to change those beliefs and views. Um, I think that's a little harsh. <laughs> but No, no. Uh, yeah, I guess. But from a like larger white scale or larger scale like white perspective, it's like we both went through the public education system. I was not anything about race. Or there was no discussion that ever took place. So it was like, yeah, you're you're right to point out when I say no one has taken any step. It's like that also is straight up erasure of the steps that uh, people of color have been taking. Uh, anyone who's time, done any work, yeah. White people as a larger group have not really taken this subject seriously from like the large scale white perspective. It's not really been a part of white collective consciousness to say we need to address this and attempt to make equality truly occur because it's always been, you know, if things are better than they were uh, for non-white people a hundred years ago, I don't see what they're complaining about. Well, and also it just is easy to ignore, right? It's like not my problem. Yeah. I have actual problems and I have things I'd rather do and no one can make me. Yeah. So why would I spend my time worrying about this? When stuff? it is your problem, if it's, <laughs> if, ra if racism on this continent is perpetuated by white people, which it necessarily is using like the definition provided in this book of like the group with the power taking away power from other groups. So racism is perpetuated only by white people using that definition, then yes, your problem. If you're the only people doing it, then it's your problem. Yeah. And also, I would say, like, the way that it becomes your problem, too, is culturally. Because one thing that, that we white people as a group have no problem doing is... Um, consuming, and I, I and I'm talking specifically um, about black entertainment. I would say, but like mm -hmm. um, music, TV, slang, mm -hmm. particularly fashion, memes, like uh, people have zero problem like adopting the culture, and they could say, you know, you could say it's because this is what I'm into, but. Um, what ends up happening is, you know, you start to feel alienated. The way that I see it pop up is um, people that I know complaining about, like, you know, I used, I used to love listening to CBC, but now it's all, like, none of it's for me anymore. It's all... And, and the thing, what's really happening is, like, it's not that none of it's for you. It's just not all for you. Yeah. And... The and this would be the fragility exactly where it's like now they're talking about this stuff and I don't want to hear about that and they're talking about these people and why are they taking over my airways yeah. and like do they not pay taxes too like totally but totally it is just they still totally it's, like, <laughs> it's still mostly about you and it's like yeah even it's probably not even a proportional representation from like a the amount of dollars that you're putting into this product that uh that other marginalized groups are getting out of it but it's like the very involvement of stories that don't reflect your own experience are an affront to your uh, your right to be entertained, I guess. 
but it you know what it also is though is disorienting like if you're used to it being about you all the time and then all of a sudden it isn't mm -hmm. then it's weird then you feel like you're losing control or like and i say this as somebody yeah. who has experienced that yeah and i would say also um as we've seen, especially in the last 20 years with rock music and, you know, people were saying it was played out in the nineties and, and maybe it was, but you know, the, there, there are so many me uh, reasons why it has kind of fallen out of favor. Maybe it just ran its course. Um, innovation is being done elsewhere. Um, but let's take a look at, so you know who Rick Beato is? No, he's a YouTuber. He's an old white guy who likes rock music, but mm -hmm. They did a, a video one day where he was, you know, sitting around with a bunch of his white buddies and they're talking about what happened to rock music. And from their point of view is when the blues element started being taken out of rock, that things really started to go down the tubes. And now there's like no blues left in it and nobody cares anymore. So you see, to me, it's like I, I would say when like things like quantization and, and uh, a lot of software editing and there's like a million reasons why that's happened largely it's easier to do yeah. but what gets lost is sort of like the visceral magic that made that music exciting once upon a time but also this is music that was invented by black people that yeah. they were then forced out of yeah and so they went and did something else and now that's the new thing totally right? it's like yeah yeah there's there's <laughs> <laughs> There's this idea that like when rock lost blues, it stopped being legit. And there's but no one would ever at that table would ever say, Well, when rock displaced black people, it stopped being legit. Because it's like what we want to naturally do is separate blues and race, essentially. Because blues is a a phenomenon that's not that complicated. It's a style of music. You can hear music and you know it's blues. But then you've a lot of white people it and have done it. It's incredibly complicated. Point. And it's a part of a system that you're complicit in. And and it it becomes much more challenging. Sorry, what becomes much more challenging? Um, just that conversation of like you're having a basic conversation of like when did rock stop being legit? When did rock lose its way? If you bring the very genuine question of race into that, especially when your crux is about blues, it's like then it, it's a it's a lot more or it's a lot easier to say rock um, stop being legit when the blues left than it is to say rock stopped being legit when it stopped wanting to include black people or whenever it was essentially just co-opted by white people. And when it, then, yeah. When it was strictly white people's music. Yeah. 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 Uh, but then, I mean, then your YouTube channel is getting political and maybe of it's course, politically bring politics into it. It. And of course too, it's like race is political inherently, but I don't, I don't know. There's definitely a frustration around the way that people are allowed to define what political is. And people want to avoid the political. <laughs> I don't know. Why is race politics? <laughs> I don't know either. I feel like that is a way. I think in that sense, I mean, I, th I think things are political in that they have political implications. But I think that also um, sometimes it's just a way to dismiss something mm -hmm. that you don't want to deal with. Mm -hmm. Where you're like, no, that's political. I don't want to mm -hmm. touch totally. that. I need to. Uh, I'm gonna interrupt. I need to pee. I'll be right back. Go for it. I'm gonna pause. Okay. Pee and pause. Okay, we're recording now. James has just told me that he doesn't want 
to rehearse this, so this is completely off the cuff, off script, folks. You're getting uh, the unfiltered. No, but I was I was sort of wondering, um, like what, like what are the inherent, because we're we're two white people trying to make an effort to begin to educate ourselves, and it's like, again, begin by congratulating myself, but it's like, what are sort of the pitfalls that necessarily occur when like two white people who are trying to their best to like begin to understand something, like have a conversation like this where it's like, I think we both for most of the conversation have been somewhat not congratulating each other, but entirely agreeable. Right. Neither yeah. And like really there is something the, smug about that. Neither of us has the, um, the necessary experience to like understand whenever we are making racial transgressions or saying something that's like totally whack. Like I, <laughs> I for instance, yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. But I don't know. Like I don't, I, I, I would think that even that would depend on context. I would say for myself, certainly I am someone who is, I, I am the person who is like I'm not gonna be I'm not someone who has an interest in like yelling racial slurs out of a car or something like <laughs> I'm not <laughs> that, good, that's good, not good that know. doesn't appeal to me. I appreciate as, that you finally said this. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, as an activity, that's not really where where I'm at these days, but. Um, or ever just to be like maybe that's maybe that's a dumb joke and maybe that's that's an uh, example of it but i would say i am more likely to be the person who just like becomes awkward because i don't know what to do totally. and i don't want to yeah. do the wrong thing and i want to prove that i'm like this like good person yeah I feel, and, I feel like that in my history has been my space as well i've typically yeah. been someone who I just want everyone to have a good time. If some if someone does something that makes me uncomfortable, I'll quiet down. I stop participating, but I don't say or do anything to put a stop to it. And in yeah. the few instances where I did too, it's like I I made no difference. It's like there have been instances, and it's not even within specifically race uh, or like instances where my friends were like perpetuating racism or something like that but it's like there have definitely been instances in my life where i say like what you're doing is wrong for these reasons and then you essentially just get like somewhat ridiculed and it's like but i didn't like leave i didn't try and like i i don't know i feel like what i did after was resign myself to the situation and choose to forget about it and forgive these people and not ever bring it up again. Yeah, well, I would say for myself too, like there have definitely been times and there have been like lots of times when I've let it slide, lots of times when I didn't know any better, but there have definitely been times where I have made a comment, like I can think of a few times, only a few, where somebody makes uh, maybe a racist or a racially insensitive joke and I would say something about it and you're right. People just be like, oh, come on. It's just a joke. You know, it's just a joke. It's yeah. like, that's not serious. And it's just like funny because you're not supposed to say it. And we know we're not supposed to say it. Yeah, totally. And it's like, I usually in my life, I like, I don't, I still don't know a response to that. Or like, it's like, and I feel like one of the things that um, I've understood and this comes to a bigger point, I guess, where it's like, I guess I'll, I'll say it first. One of the things that I've understood is that like, this is very much the beginning of like a lot more learning that I need to do. And also to that point, I think whenever we were discussing like reading this book, I think there within the past couple of months has been like some controversy around it and around the way it's framed. And I also think, one thing I've heard a decent amount is like, don't read that book, read this book instead. And one of the things I find so interesting is like, why can we only, why 
is the bar at one book. I know. Why not read both? I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought too. And that was like, I know I had heard that too. And I was still like, w- yeah, but okay. But why not know what it's about? Totally. Totally. And it's like, why? So it's like, you are, especially coming from my perspective and also the perspective of like most of the people who I've heard sort of communicate this idea have been white people. Um, and it's like, so you are a white person. You believe that racial injustice is very bad. Uh, you probably at that point, if you're thinking about reading these books, are beginning to understand that you have a part to play within this and that you have more to learn in order to try and combat racism. Why? Yeah, why is it one book? Yeah. Why, why are... <laughs> Why is there this assumption that you go and you do the work this summer and then it's over and then you're not racist anymore? Right. Well, and so to to bring to bring it back to what are we doing here? um, Part of our own idea to to give ourselves another nice pat on the back. Good for us (laughs) is we're like, let's uh, put this off in the distance a little bit so that we'll be committed to. Uh, doing this work when it's no longer such a trending topic and it's still kind of trending, but it's not as much as it was certainly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what I found too. And I, and so I also found like I went after hearing some um, hearing that criticisms of it existed. I did go looking for some and th- what I felt too is like, I'm not really interested in criticisms of this book from other white people. Yeah. Like totally. I don't, yeah. I can make up my own mind um if there are criticisms um from people of color i am interested in those uh there is one in the atlantic from um there's uh this guy's a columbia professor john mcwarder i don't know how to pronounce his name but that is one that i would read Mm -hmm. um but i would say a lot of them even you know you go on goodreads and and um whatever but a lot of the uh criticism focuses on kind of the concern that this is the only thing that people are going to do like i read one that said uh i don't like this book because it's a dead end it offers no way forward um which is you know that's a fair criticism if people are are only going to read this one book i yeah totally it's like it's how we were talking about um how I'll sit silent whenever someone is like doing something racist or something like that. And maybe I'll say something and then they have a retort and I don't know how to respond. And I was, when I was saying that, I was thinking about how it's like, but I read this whole book and I still don't know how to respond. Like, it's like, yeah, right. why didn't the Where book teach me how to respond? And it's like, because that's not like, it's the reason I don't know how to respond is because my understanding of racism and how it manifests is so much less complete than our inherent understanding of essentially white supremacy and believing that everything's okay. It's like I've lived my entire life thinking that as long as you're not shouting racial slurs, you're not a racist. So that is going to stay with me for a long time. But I can't read one book and then know everything to say every time. No, exactly. And and so another um, other, uh, that's something we we talk about in a second. Another criticism that I saw was that um, this guy was like, well, you know, after reading this book, like her argument is, you're either a fragile racist or you're a fragile racist. There's no way out. And like, yeah, that is what she's saying. Totally. She's saying like, if you are a white person, you can't help it. You're, you're been brought up in a racist system. You are, yeah. This is a generalization I am going to make about you. But the thing that I found interesting about that is, for the dude who wrote this article, it's like, no, she didn't give you an out, but you made your own somehow. Yeah. Like you managed to figure that out. You didn't totally. read it in the book, really. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Right. Also, it's like. That's that's the thing that, especially as white people talking about racism, it'll be like, nah, don't read this because it's like, 
it's not the right answer where it's like, I studied philosophy in university and I've been in many classes where it's like, so um, this philosopher discussed this idea 50 years later, a new idea came along and people sort of tossed away this old idea, but we're still going to study this old idea because it has a very useful framework from which we can develop new things. And it's like, but it seems like with this particular conversation, we're still stuck in that, like wanting to be right or wrong. So it's like, yep. because you don't agree with every premise of this book, every conclusion, then the book has no value. When it's like, it would be much more useful if you could, if we could all just read the book and say, what did you appreciate about it? What did you not appreciate about it? What, like, what things will you take with you? And what things do you think can be tossed aside a little bit? Well, yeah. Like, did you get anything at all out of reading it? Like I definitely did. I got more than I was led to believe I would. Yeah. Well, because also it's like just speaking towards specifically criticisms of the book by like essentially white people is like one that I I think about it all the time because it was two people that I like respect and um, and this was like two months ago before I had read the book and I, I was curious about it but I heard these two white men talking in the park friends of mine um, and they brought up this book they brought up how the author does like just these corporate diversity training things. Um, they were like, so she's like super corporate. She works for like Netflix and Amazon and stuff like that. Um, Do you watch and, Netflix or order things on Amazon? Well, yeah, yeah, which is a <laughs> which is a very valid uh, concern. But also, it was it was literally people I enjoy and respect, like going on to say like. People don't think about things like you or I do. They just want to be told what to think. And, you know, people don't, they, most people, even like left-leaning people, they don't think about these things. They just try and go find like the popular narrative. And it's like, you're literally two white dudes who didn't read a book who are just roasting it because, yeah, the fucking streaming service you're going to use later tonight. Yeah paid this person a couple thousand dollars and it's like that excuses us from having to read or engage with or anything and what the crux of the conversation was is we are smarter than the rest of white people and we understand the right way to go about things like combating racism and to go about things like uh, addressing the larger I guess philosophical or very complicated issues within this world and it's like how are we going to get anywhere if you're sitting here patting yourself on the back, which also we've done tonight too, where it's like, it's just, it seems like our nature is to pat ourselves on the back and feel like, well, I think about things in a way that most people don't. Well, and get the unpleasant thing out of the way. So, cause what it does is it, it, it excuses you from having to do any more work or like <laughs> grapple with anything difficult or be uncomfortable or be exposed as wrong because this is the other thing that i was thinking i was like even if even if we are idiots for thinking that we got something good out of this like i think really the best possible outcome is that we look back at this in a year and be like wow we were so naive yeah you know because that means we've evolved in our understanding and we can actually see that growth and progress yeah Totally, totally. And yeah, I absolutely hope that I can look back on this in a year and think, wow, we were so naive because it's like, You're like I was an idiot. I absolutely, with my understanding of issues regarding racial justice and where I fit within them, how can I begin to believe that I understand them? I have never, I, I'm just beginning to address it. I'm just beginning to try to lump in and it's literally because uh, not even because one black man died, it's because like there were like five or six highly publicized black murders that occurred in the States this year 
and then people went to the streets and that was enough for me to go you know what i can begin to do the bare minimum yep and it's right because you do get like you know and you'll get shaken up by them like trayvon martin was like what the fuck and then um the guy now i'm blanking in his on his name even the the guy last year but this is what i mean it's like it's like so commonplace totally that it's like you, it's hard to even store all the names of the murdered minorities that were just yeah. brushed aside and when no prosecution is expected no justice is expected we have it on video yep no justice is expected well, and like the story of Emmett Till in the book, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kid was 14 years old. I didn't realize that. I mean, it probably said it, but I didn't catch it. He was but 14 years old, it. accused of flirting with a white woman, and he was murdered over that. Not even yep. murdered, brutally, like beaten to death. Because to yep. be murdered, if you are to shoot me, that's one thing. But if you are to battery me to the point where my body stops working, that's a different thing in my mind. And that's yeah. also what we're seeing in this. <laughs> but, um, but, but a kid, a child. Yeah. And so at that point too, it's like, if you were willing to do that to another human being, you were just looking for an excuse. Yeah. Like you can't possibly have so been so outraged at the idea that this kid was flirting with your wife. Well, and the lady who, said that it happened, said 40 years later that it didn't happen. Yeah, after they murdered him and were acquitted. Yeah, so, and it's like that was not that long ago. It's so, yeah, so there's a big question as to how we as white people went from essentially collectively believing that that we didn't believe that that was okay, but a jury of their peers acquitted them. Um, so societally, we believed that that was okay, even if personally you would think, oh, it's not good that that happened. But how do we go from that to 50 years later being like, oh, we've uh, we've sorted that. If we trust this. Well, but even like here in New Brunswick in the summer, like we had uh, Chantel Moore and Rodney Levi both killed by police, both during wellness checks. In Ontario, yeah. you have police like kicking in the doors of mentally un unstable people's with houses and shooting them. With people are communicating to them these people's needs. It's not like they don't know. Yeah. It's not like for lack of information available to us. It's because we have created systems that are only capable of um, responding with violence, and then it responds violently. And we've also created a system where uh, police are not, um, they don't experience the same justice system as private citizens do. And I, it's so strange to understand that and not have an understanding of how do we do that, even where it's like, so far as to go that I believe that Justin Trudeau, who is a very problematic figure, I am not generally a fan, but it's like, I do believe that he understands that the policing system in Canada is unjust to uh, racial minorities. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe that he has any ideas on how to address that. No, that he has a solution. No, I, I mean, I, I would be very... How would he know? How would he know? He's never even had to... He was fucking in brown face and black face 10 years ago. I know, 20 years ago. <laughs> and also is just a school teacher who became a politician. Mm -hmm. totally. totally. He's not an expert on anything. No. And it's like, so that's sort of what we're stuck with, though, and it, where it's like, it is a very frustrating thing to feel like the the police system is a publicly funded entity, but I don't know how to 
uh, how to affect it through the democratic process. I don't know how to vote in a way that can work for the reforms that I want to see to the police. And also it's like, I've seen that whenever people go to the streets to do that, they literally just get gassed and arrested. Well, yeah, or it's like, you know, you can vote for some fr for some fringe party. You can throw away your vote on somebody that's going to have no clout. And then we get into, of course, like politi party politics and the culture of just winning and that being the game. And, and then you get back to buzzwords. I heard... Um, a, Driving home tonight, I heard on CBC Radio, Cross Country Checkup, they were talking about the leadership convention for the Conservative Party. Yeah. You got one guy who's like saying he won't give an inch to political correctness. Then another guy who's saying he's going to get the country back on track. And all of them are saying we need a true conservative who's like... And so what is any of that stuff about? Like, totally. It's just is about signaling to your voters that, number one, it's about vilifying somebody else uh -huh. and creating division and trying to show that you're going to be the person who stands up for your people against your enemies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's so interesting and unfortunate. I was like, we, I, I don't have the slightest beginning of an understanding of how we can positively affect issues of, say, particularly police violence against minorities from the point of view of a private citizen. But I guess what you can do is try and understand where you fit within that system and what you can do to both, with your own actions and words, do your best to not perpetuate a system of racism and white supremacy and also you would hope that by doing that and that by especially doing that with a lot of practice and doing it consistently, even when it feels uncomfortable, you would hope that that then moves other people to also make more of an effort to ad address the issues of racism and white supremacy, because it seems like we've been somewhat abandoned by formal political structures in that sense. But what you said in terms of that, uh, that conservative convention and the way those people are talking, they're not talking about policy. They're talking about how can I jump on the popular perspective of the people in this room. So all yeah. you can do is attempt to shift the popular perspective in many, in many circumstances. Yeah, because if you want to get a group that's big enough to win something, you need to be a cohesive group. You need to stand for something. It helps to have an enemy because that's a, one way of building momentum. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be applied to, you know, defunding the police in the same way of, <laughs> you know, because one of the dangers of this, like, wanting to be correct is, and especially in social media where it's the highlight reel so now it's also like the woke highlight reel of okay. like, I'm, you know, sharing these perspectives so that I can also share my, I can post my Instagram of like my selfie or my dinner without uh, feeling guilty about it. Like I'm not doing anything. Totally. Um, but also just the, there's, I feel there's like, you feel like, you know, it's easy to feel like you're not doing enough or like you need to kind of go out and make a statement because that's what you're supposed to do. And I think that that is, you know, there is a positive social effect to doing that. I've learned a lot as a result of that. Yeah. And I think like that can be a form of positive peer pressure where we kind of normalize um, speaking up about those things. I think with regard to police, I think, um, it's not only not participating in, but disrupting the system and speaking out about it wherever you can. I also think something that you can do within the current system is bug your MPs and yeah. MLAs. Yeah. Yeah. And totally. it may not get you anywhere, but at least they're very aware that their constituents have these priorities and opinions. Totally. Totally. Yeah. 
And I mean, that's, yeah. And making a, uh, uh, like, habit of that as well, which is something that I need to work on as well, because it's like I've definitely wrote to, written to my MLA as an MP and things like that and said, like, you need to do this, but not... It's like, honestly, I would do better to write a personalized letter monthly reaffirming that these changes that I want right. to take place, right? Where it's like, I have never done it. I, I know and it it's month. even just as I'm thinking about it now, it's like, yeah, that's stuff you can do. And I know people who talk about it, but I have never done it. I did. I certainly have signed. I think like, it was pretty easy. Yeah. I mean, I've signed, you know petitions or letters that form letters that get sent to politicians yeah yeah which honestly too it's like those aren't that effective um i would think so they just get spam filtered um yeah right it's like i have um i feel like at this point i've written all of the levels of government that represent me one time and it's like yeah. why was it just once though if I really care, why was it just once? Like, and, and, and I guess too, it's like that asking that question twice or getting caught up in that question is a, a, a typical example of like guilt rather than action and guilt in many ways uh, leads to inaction because I feel bad. And it's not the question, why was it just once? It's more so the action if you want to do that more, do it more. So it's like, yeah, I, I work from home. Tomorrow I can write a letter. You could do it every yeah, day. Well, 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 part of it is like we get used to inaction. We get used to whatever our routines are. Part of it is probably uh, some level of distrust in the system. Part of it is probably feeling like you can't make a difference individually. Mm-hmm. You know, and combined, it's enough to n- not do anything. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, no, no, you're right. And I, it just feels easier to, I was going to say it just feels easier to read a book, but then I guess a different thought came to my mind, which also is like, one of the things that this book in particular brought to my attention, it's sort of the way in which, discussing racism is like a muscle or discussing race is like a muscle and understanding of yourself as a white person is like a muscle where it's like, if you never do it, your muscle will suck. Yeah. But if you do it more and more, you'll gain understanding and you'll gain ability and you'll gain to, um, the ability to do so without triggering white fragility and without, so it's like if someone accuses me of racism, probably the next time someone accuses me of racism, which will occur in my life, probably because I will perpetuate racist uh, uh, ideas or say something or actions or and probably even have within this conversation, definitely have within this conversation. Mm-hmm. I would even go so far as to say, but it's like I feel like also that idea doesn't only hold to something like discussing racism where it's like if we're both sitting here being like you can write your mla i did it once um and doing it several times is just an act of like the second time i do it is only the second time i do it you know and it's like you can think about that as a muscle as well things like that where it's like partaking in democracy in a larger way can also be thought of as a muscle and just normalizing ideas like that where, or say you're someone who like writes letters to the editor. It seems like in this world, there's people who have never written a letter to the editor who have written one letter to the editor or, or who have written 70 letters to the editor. Yeah. Write one every week. Yeah. And it's just, it's just that muscle. As soon as you've written five, it becomes normal and you believe that your voice is legitimized even if it gets published or not. Yes. Cool. All right. So um, we could talk about this all day. It's um, just turned to 10.59 p.m. here. I should uh, wrap wrap it up on my end. But So next steps, speaking of uh, using that muscle, um, 
do you feel that your work is done? I think we've covered that. We <laughs> we have agreed that our work is not done after having read this one book. So uh, what are next steps? I can tell you mine. You can tell me yours. What what else are you uh, have you done? Are you considering doing? Um, I think like one thing that I did within uh, a a bit ago is like I run a very stringent budget. Every every dollar that leaves my pockets is like accounted for within an app and things like that. And it's like one thing was just putting donating into that, and it's yeah. like you find the money when you set aside the money essentially it's like whenever i told myself that that was a priority it became very easy to do so that's one thing that i think also shouldn't be like set aside or be like oh it's easy to just give money because honestly it's like it's also one of the most useful things you can do is like give away your money there are organizations that need it and if you don't give it to them they won't survive. Well, and it also is like one of the least visible things you can do too, which uh-huh. is like, I feel like it's part of the reason why that's it all. You don't get the reward of like, you know, unless you post your donation receipt to social media, which <laughs> I have seen people do. Um, if it's, if you raised money and made a big donation, good for you. I do it once. Yeah. But, but yeah. you know, it's not really cool to do that in the same way. No, it's not. And I'll, yeah, I feel I feel complicated feelings about that too because it's like I've seen that before though too, and been like, well, what am I doing? I need to donate more money. This person's donating more money, so it's like it is complicated. Positive it does pressure. feel very self congratulatory. But I mean, whatever your feelings, it's like I if, even did it. I didn't post the amount though. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> now that I think about it, <laughs> but but from a larger context, it's just like, especially if you're a white person, and especially if you're a white person that's not like dirt poor. It's like a year ago, I was much poorer than I am now because now I have like a reasonable adult job, and it's like now I can have a budget and work that into it, and feel like I can both contribute in a way that feels meaningful and meet all of my base needs and i do think it's like if you're super poor i don't think it's on you at a certain point i don't think that anyone should feel bad for not um for not spending money they don't have essentially but it's like if you Mm -hmm. have money i absolutely think that you should be moving it towards causes that you believe in um aside from that it's like this was one book that i read and then I feel like it, I, I, I thought whenever, like a couple months ago, whenever like race was brought to the forefront that I would read, I would start with trying to read a book and then that I would read a couple and then, but I didn't really see where it would go or when it would end. And it's like, I feel like what I'm realizing is that it, or I can't, ever stop doing that it's like again the muscle thing of putting uh books addressing race just into my rotation of literature rather than Mm -hmm. feeling like the next book i read is probably going to be a fiction novel for escapism so i can go back to just enjoying and not really being challenged by literature and then maybe I'll read another thing like that. Or maybe I'll read, like, I have a James Baldwin novel that's not, that's, like, not one of the, like, you need to read this book to understand the black perspective things. It's, like, it's a story, and I'm interested to just read, like, expand the way I view fiction and read uh, stories from non-white authors and put that into my rotation part. And to not always think of it as like a, you have to take concrete action, but think of it as a like, you have to normalize not being white within not only your friendships and things like that, but also the media that you consume. Yeah, expanding your your kind of frame of reference. And that just made me think of two things, which I, I think are, are, are worth mentioning here that we didn't really talk about, but both are brought up 
um, in the book. One is the idea of white as normal, which we did talk uh, about, I guess, to some degree, where it's like we're just used to like if if you see a white person on TV, it's not a white person on TV; it's a normal person. Mm-hmm. This was oh was, uh, something that I thought about recently too. So um, Jane, my wife, uh, was doing a job interview, and she had gotten some feedback from one of her recruiters that um, defined it was like sort of a like like female equating female characteristics with being like weak uh-huh, and uh-huh. and so anyway she was like asking and um you know i asked you around like what are like words that men would use like like kind of male like powerful masculine words and she was like looking it up and not really having success and she was frustrated by it and she was kind of describing it with it and then i realized i was like you know why i was like thinking about what i would do uh-huh. if if i were in that job every i was like you know why you're not finding what you want because you shouldn't look for, you know, you shouldn't s- Google search masculine words. You should just search words. Totally. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's the same exactly. thing. Because the person is just searching for something that is not unusual. Yeah. Like if I am looking for word, like I'm going to find the one that's written by a men's magazine. I'm not, I'm not going to go looking for the thing that a women's magazine has written on how to sound more manly in a job interview. Totally. For yeah. me, you know? That's why I bring nuance into the situation when I have already understand it entirely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what was, oh, and then the other one was um, because we often live in racially segregated communities, our ideas of what people who don't look like us or share a cultural background, where those ideas come from is often uh, from our entertainment. Yeah, totally. Um, so that is also why that matters. Totally, totally. And it's like, yeah, if you if you're if all of your entertainment is like created entirely by white people, it's like you will have characters of color, but they were written by white people. So there's no yeah, genuineness are, within those. It's within that portrayal. Yeah, and and I think we probably are seeing more of a, a democratization of that, both because like we there we are um, getting to a point where companies don't want to get that criticism, so mm-hmm. they're they're uh, looking to in, include uh, diversity in their lineups. But um, also some, something that she mentioned in the book. Um, and I don't know if this is like now or more of a historical thing. I do know like Jane watched breakfast at Tiffany's recently. Have you ever uh-huh. seen that one? No, I haven't. I've heard about this legendary, super racist Asian character. Yeah. Played by a white guy. Yeah. I want to say it was Mickey Rooney. Um, why? Cause they couldn't find an Asian actor like, and, and it, to, to play this stereotype anyway. But, um, Anyhow, the the point that's made in the book is that also like the people who are making these decisions are the most insulated from those conditions, uh-huh. um, and they're deciding what goes on screen. Um, I I don't know if that's still the case, but anyhow, like in many, well, it's like yeah, it's the money thing, I guess, in many ways, where it's like in order to achieve success, you have to leave disadvantage in some ways or like you have to and it's this is something that was talked about in the book too where it's like success and whiteness sort of go hand in hand where it's like a good neighborhood is a white neighborhood and things like that so it's like the more money people get generally the less time you spend in like uh, particularly non-white areas and um, I don't know. The more money you get, the the more closed off you become. Though, the less yeah. you would ever encounter opinions that you don't need to encounter, because it's like you can pick and choose what you partake in, because everything you do is already taken care of. You don't have to step outside your comfort zone because you're okay. 
Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. You just don't ever have to deal with stuff that you don't want to. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and you were asking about what concrete things. I feel like there was another one. So I said donate money. I feel like I got to read more and in varying ways, not just like instructional booklets about how to combat racism, but also yeah. just like expand. Um, expand in person. general. I guess too, it's like just... Um, I feel like it's twofold is like trying to be receptive to uh, the criticisms that I receive and trying to like hold back my defensive feeling. Um, and also trying to navigate that a bit better with other white people too, because it's like, it's not always useful to phrase something the wrong way. And it's like, if anyone should have to be the people to sidestep issues in order to make white people feel better, like we can bear the brunt of that work. It can be other white people who have to do that. I know I don't always want to do that, but it's like I have had circumstances where I say something to someone and I didn't say it the right way. And so then we just don't talk for several months. Right. And I, I think that's something that I've learned over the past couple of months is I can bring more of an effort to just like make it worth your time to say something in a way that you think this person would be receptive to the idea because it's not about right or wrong. It's about the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also um, not about intention, which again is like, that's kind of a universal concept but it certainly showed up here um, where, you know, if, if I, um, if I hurt you, if I upset you, but I didn't mean to, then you should just get over it. Yeah. Because I didn't, but if, but it's like, you know, if I punch you, but I didn't think it was, would hurt. Like totally. that's still my fault. Totally, yeah. <laughs> it was still my fist flying through the air, like, yeah. and, and it didn't have to be that way. And also, yeah, and, and just, yeah, the acknowledgement that I guess every action that you do has consequences, and you can't like totally isolate it. And yeah, just yeah, and intention is not a very good reason. Is what I is what I've been learning a lot. Is like. Because intention is good. You always believe that your intention was good. And wanting to be good is not an excuse to be bad. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, or, or, or my intention is at least not bad. So, for instance, I have a T-shirt that I bought in L.A. Uh -huh. that is, and I had just finished watching Narcos on Netflix. Uh -huh. And it's Bart Simpson as Pablo Escobar. Uh -huh. And so it says Escobart oh, and he's like got a mustache and a cigarette. And I thought it was just funny and like kind of uh, like, oh, yeah, hi, because I just watched this show. Uh -huh. Right. But I don't know if that shirt is really cool for me to wear. Yeah. And, you know, and I even thought about it. It's like, well, it's like I didn't make it. I'm just like maybe I'm like showing people what their own culture is. Yeah. But I'm not. But also, that's not what anyone's going to assume whenever you wear it. No one's going to be like, hey, he's showing us what our culture is. No. <laughs> it's like you can, it's the great, the mental gymnastics that you can go through to justify it in your own mind. But also, it's like we do have an understanding of how other people will interpret our actions. Yeah. And we choose to think they'll interpret it in the best possible way. And that that's the only way that it should be judged. Whenever it's like, Outcome is absolutely necess like necessary to acknowledge whenever you're doing any sort of action. And it's like, dude, yeah. I, I don't know about that shirt. I don't <laughs> I don't know either. I wouldn't like, see I, you wearing it, though, and think, hey, he's telling us about our culture. <laughs> no. I mean, it would be like, you know, it fits well. It's like, kind of, but... Probably like you know. forty bucks or something. No, no, it was ten dollars. Okay, okay. Yeah, it was at this like outdoor. Um, I don't know if it was like a. Is it not a. I don't maybe like flea market is the wrong term, but there was a bunch of vendors. Mm -hmm. I had some sunglasses and and I bought. It was the only clothing item I bought. It's the market. 
Yeah. Take away the flea. Yeah. But yeah, right. It's like, it's not really my call. But I also don't want <laughs> to like be wearing it and then go up to somebody and be like, hey, is this, is this offensive that so I'm wearing really. this? You know? Like, <laughs> And it's like, how do you Google, like, is my Pablo Escobar shirt offensive? Right. Yeah. Especially, too, because it's like that perspective is not super known, even. There's a reason we have no idea how to answer that question. It's like, because I know Pablo Escobar as a legendary criminal, and yep. I know there's shows about him, and I know he was rich, but it's like, I don't say, yeah, and then his race would be incidental in that in yeah, that context. Yeah, no, because he's just a, a, what is it, an anti-hero. <laughs> he's an anti-hero. Right. But it's like, I don't actually know how anyone from, like, Colombia feels about him. No, I don't either. <laughs> and I never, I honestly never thought to find out. No. Well, who do you know from Colombia? Yeah, honestly. Shakira? I lived with someone from Colombia once. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, there were chances. But also, I mean, and this is the other flip side and interesting point of it. I think he, I think he was Colombian. I don't think he... I think maybe he was born in Colombia, but was had lived in Ottawa for probably since at least young childhood. I think also it's like, if I were to ask him about that, and I guess I'm making an assumption, but it's like, it is an assumption based off of what I knew about this person. I'm not certain I would get a like entirely nuanced take or like, but it's an assumption. Yeah. Why didn't I ask? Don't know. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. And why do I need a nuanced take from this person? Why do I, it's like, I'm literally faced with, why does he owe you that? Yeah, I'm, fa I'm faced with an opportunity that I could have taken where I had a relationship of trust where I could have learned more about the world exterior to my experience. And now I'm just justifying it with like, the answer wouldn't have been good enough for me. Right. It didn't matter anyway. It was stupid. <laughs> I'm better off to not know. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah, the way that it just continually... Like I will assume I'm right all the time. It is it is a muscle to try and remind yourself that that's not the case. Well, to step outside of that, well, and I think that is human nature because there is a thing, and there's like a David Foster Wallace speech or whatever. I think it was like a, a commencement speech. Is that what we say at university graduation? Uh -huh. But he's like, I, I can't even remember the context. He's telling people maybe to get out and get some experience. He's like, I've lived in this world for however many years at the time. And he's like, I have never had an experience. I've never had an experience that has not um, seemed to prove that I am the absolute center of the universe. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's, yeah, absolutely. Whereas I go around my entire life still believing that. And I'm going to. It's the same thing with like accepting that you're going to. Uh, commit racial transgressions. You're going to be racist. You're going to enact racism. It's like you're also going to go through the world thinking that your point of view is somewhat objective, but that what you're thinking and saying is important and necessary. And it's like it's important to realize that that's not the truth, but it's also important to accept that that is the case, and you know, forgive yourself for that essentially, because well, guilt is not helpful. That's the big thing. And, and I think also like uh, offloading the idea of racism from being a personal thing to a systemic thing. Mm -hmm. um, the thing it's like, yes, it makes it inescapable, but it also gives you um, like an out in, in terms of an individual instance of something mm -hmm. where you can say, okay, that thing I did was racist. I didn't mean for it to be. I didn't maybe understand that it was, or maybe, maybe I wasn't sure if I had crossed the line or not. Um, but what understanding that can do is allow you to say, okay, yes, but that's also normal for someone like me to do. Mm -hmm. So it's a learning opportunity 
and then I can go about my life and not have this, like, not be ruined by it. Totally, exactly. It's like, that thing I did was racist. That is okay. Where do I go from here? Do I reject that notion, or do I try and learn from the experience? And we have historically rejected that notion. We have yeah. not. And not only rejected, but also discredited. it. Um, try to fight it, yeah. Yeah, by it, like it's like anytime anyone accuses you of racism, it's no, I wasn't being racist. I what I was doing actually was this thing, and it's a total discrediting of the person who took the time to speak up. And yeah, I think the most important thing is moving away from that and just normalizing the idea that like we're white people, we're gonna be racist sometimes, and it's because the whole like society we're in is pretty racist and what we want to do is affect that in a positive manner and make it less racist but it's it's tough to learn if you already know so if you think you already know you're not going to learn because you don't have to what's that there's no reason to no, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. um, I don't know. And it's, I guess it's like, comes back to the guilt thing. I think like, why am I only learning about this now? Or why am I only taking the time to explore this now? And it's like, I need to remind myself to stop saying that. Because it's not why am I only learning about this now? It's like, what's the next thing I'm going to do? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So speaking of, um, uh, I will, I'll, I'll put myself on the record. Uh, next steps for me, I picked up, uh, white supremacy in me or me and white supremacy. I can't remember what the order of the words are in the title, mm -hmm. uh, by Layla Saad, which was something that was recommended for anybody who is, um, curious about it audible has got a free thing that you can down not to plug audible although yeah. they can sponsor my podcast yeah. if they want to um but there's a free like 20 25 minute thing where she talks about the book it's an interview mm -hmm. uh I, yeah i picked it up at the just the bookstore in the mall uh forward to it is written by robin d'angelo interestingly mm -hmm. enough um which was funny because like this was that was one of the books that was recommended to me as like oh don't read that one but this one is uh, supposed to be a good one I was like okay who, but who did you get to write the intro uh -huh. and and maybe uh, that's you know as a way to sell it to white people because again coming back to our original thing um, it's easier for white people to take this kind of feedback from other white people I think yeah even just in the sense of like. You know who listens to this show? I think that my audience is pretty largely white people. Yeah. Um, which I mean, so am I. So whatever. That's not to be expected. And also, when I think about you know, like who I get to be on the show, it's easier to find white people because that's who most of my friends are. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are, there are societal reasons for that, but um, it is what it is. But when when you're aware of it, then you can you can. Uh, work around it or against it or within that well that's it too right where it's like it's one it's it's one thing to say um, all my friends are white people all my I but it's not my fault essentially or it's another thing to say like most of the people in my circles are white people and that brings upon a responsibility for me to address whiteness in a sense within my groups a little bit and to just because we're a bunch of white people doesn't mean that we are doesn't mean that we don't have to speak about this or that we're exter exterior to race and it's like even if i and it's like it's not wrong to have other white friends but it's like it is i would say it is wrong to like never address the fact that all of your friends are white. Right. Yeah. Once you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once you notice, and I think you can't, you can't help but notice, 
Um, but yeah, so one thing is like I went to uh, university. I went through a jazz program, mm-hmm. and the only black person I can recall seeing there in five years was Misha Bruger Gosman, who was there for one day once. Mm-hmm. Yep. In oh. a jazz program. Mm-hmm. I am. Yeah. So. Um, and, yeah. and, and that sort of speaks to what you're both dealing with and up against and come from. And that's why it's going to take so long to experience any progress and why it's like we have to begin to understand that we can't excuse ourselves from uh, sort of racist behavior or beliefs or anything like that because it's like especially within certain areas in this country it's like racial segregation is so extreme that how could you even begin to understand the concept of racism if like you've yeah. never had any reason to reflect on it whatsoever oh yeah no i i i no i think uh yeah i think that's tough um uh uh yeah so uh, yeah i would say so i'm i'm going to read that book i also in my classic overcommitter style i signed up for something called unreal life initiative which was it was supposed to be in real life initiative like irl people meet up and it was going to be at safi fest uh-huh. but covid has sidelined that so they turned it into url and called it unreal life that's funny um yeah that's yeah it's like really it, clever <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but so it is a a group that is like it's designed to tackle uh questions of race and racism in the Canadian music industry. Um I also signed up for the University of Alberta course on Indigenous Canada mm-hmm. which I have not started yet. Um because it's like as I've been discovering going through these things like the Indigenous Canada course is two hours a week. I also signed up for an Ableton Live course, which is four or five hours a week. Um, Unreal Life is like they want you to put in two to three hours a week. And so now I'm up to like 11 hours a week of extracurricular just studying. Um, So I've been kind of prioritizing some things over. I, I haven't cracked the the Indigenous Canada course is what I'm saying or the Ableton Live one. Um, because I just, I have too many things. Uh, that's why this has been a good project for me. Um, but one thing that I saw, I don't know if you saw this, I posted on Instagram, uh, but Dan Levy, um, of Schitt's Creek fame, Mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, he signed up for it and he's like, this seems like a good thing. And so I'm going to have a discussion group on my Instagram every Sunday about this week's lesson. That's cool. That's great. It is. And so for me, it's like, that's something I want to be able to participate in. So it's uh-huh. a reason for me to finally um, check out the course. So, totally, so that may totally. be, and it's that also, it's my next to thing. like what you can do as a white person, to like the good that you can do, because that is literally like a white person encouraging other white people to learn about their whiteness and also learn about uh, other races and cultures and what, whiteness is meant to those races and cultures and like just where you are well yeah and like what and also like where like what is canada like we we -hmm. live here you know i guess another Um, thing i'm realizing and like and maybe which is one of the reasons that i need to why like i i think reading this book was good but then it's like i need to it's like how you read something and then you absorb it and then for the next week or so that's like all you you sort of imitate it. But whereas like, mm-hmm. I just took a, a course about like indigeneity within Canada and made it about like, what is whiteness compared to indigeneity within Canada? And it's like, so I think I also need to like bring, broaden the scope a bit and, and bring it away sure. from whiteness a little bit. Spend some time. Well, it also is just like, you know, uh, let things trickle through your filter and then see what your filter is. Yeah. But I know like myself, if I don't, 
it, it's pretty easy for me because I would say other books that are on the back burners. I got that one called uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Maybe he's a scientist. It was like a, a lot of people were talking about it probably about a year ago. I just had put a hold on it in the library and it showed up. So I had to read that. And uh, for fiction, I've been picking away at at night. And this is the thing I got from tim ferris reading the four hour work week but he's like you read a fiction an hour of fiction every night he says reading more than one non-fiction book at a time is not really helpful but fiction can help you switch your brain off so i've been reading um the right stuff by tom wolf uh-huh. which is um it it's like I, his like fictionalized version of a thing that really happened but about the the first astronauts in the u.s oh interesting yeah, but it's funny because even there's even some parallels within that, which is like the idea is, um, you know, the, the title, the right stuff, refers to this idea that, like, in order to make it to the top and like be selected, you know, can you can you like hang with the fighter pilots and do you have what it takes to be this and like also in a job that's so dangerous where people like planes blow up, yeah, people's like parachute like their eject button doesn't work and all these different things and always. If that ever happens, it's like it's not because um, this is dangerous or something went wrong. It's like, oh, I can't, you know, he just didn't have what it took or like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. he was a good pilot. But I just don't know how you make that kind of mistake. Uh huh. Totally. Totally. Yeah. So it's so like it's the way that we that need to do is like just excuse a system. And it's so much easier to understand that, well, like the person who was negatively affected by it, though, could have done something different. Yeah, it's their fault. They didn't have to experience that. Yeah, they didn't have what it took. But we do. We're we're like, we're the good people. That's we got. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like what I recommended as a book. I don't, I really enjoy parts of it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, that was a soft no. <laughs> oh, no. I, w- I don't say that I wouldn't recommend it. I would say um, if, if you're into that kind of thing, yeah. I would recommend it. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily an essential read, but it definitely is very entertaining in parts. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. I just find for me, it's like with any kind of book, it's like the reason I get frustrated with uh, science books where, you know, the way that you prove something scientifically is you do a bunch of different tests and then you like measure, eliminate as many variables as you can. You measure the outputs. For me, it's like I don't want to read about every experiment. Just tell me what you found out and that's fine. Totally, yeah. You yeah. know, I don't need you to prove it to me 50 times. Yeah, hypothesis, conclusion, the middle can go away. Yeah. I trust you. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. You wrote a book. Um, it must be true. Well, or, or I trust the community to, yeah. you know, help me develop my filter or I can decide whether, you know, at the end of the day, how much whatever ideas actually apply to my own life anyway. But, um, another, this just popped into my head. Mm -hmm. This is like totally left field, but I was, I got a ride share once from Halifax to like Truro or Amherst with this guy who was a a science guy as a scientist. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, um, he had just finished a study and he's talking about how scientific studies get funded and he's like, yeah, we did this study and it was like to test the impact of like some chemical on bugs. And we found out that it didn't have an effect on them. And so scientifically, that's a good result. Like, mm-hmm. But if you are paying for a study, that's not a good result. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's Unless really, you're trying to prove that something's we, safe. We came to a conclusion. We asked a question and we got an answer. Yeah, but, and, but if the answer is nothing happened, then like, it's just as good as no answer because before we knew nothing was happening too. Yeah, yeah, and so if you are like paying to to fund something, like that's not something you want to pay for. No. So it the kind of scientific studies that get funded tend to be ones that are you know out to prove a particular thing. Yeah. Um. And then, so I would say where, how this ties in to this are both, 
um, I would say like media perceptions, but also like the idea. And again, the the thing that's alluded to in the book of the creation of like scientific scientific study of. Um, you know, while we have slaves, so now we need to prove that they are scientifically inferior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, totally, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that we can continue to have slaves. Otherwise, good, if we say everyone's I, equal. Yeah, that was a good point that sort of struck me when I read it. was like, yeah, this understanding that it's like our research is based off of a need to justify what we want to do. And yeah. especially when you're when what you want to do is uh, take people, force them into servitude, brutally mistreat and rape and murder them, and also you exist within this assumption that we are good people, uh, we believe in Christianity or something like that, we believe in right and wrong, we believe in equality, you necessarily... Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness? Yeah, exactly then you need to prove that what you're doing is okay. So what are you going to do in that scenario? Spend a ton of time and energy proving what you're doing is okay. And that is yeah. that has occurred. Like that was done. People yeah, exactly. spend a lot of time and effort and energy trying to prove that what they're doing is okay. Yeah, they're not starting from zero. No, no, exactly. You're not starting from zero. You're starting from how do we get this conclusion and then you're getting that conclusion. Then you're saying, whoa, look, look at this conclusion we got. The one we wanted, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that's, that's good to know. Looks like, we, uh, our, looks like our work is done here. Yeah. Oh, it's, hor- it's horrible. Um, but I don't know. It's, I guess just the more you know. And that's, that's one of the things that the book sort of brings up too, right? Is like, Whenever you deny or whenever you're like, no, what I meant was what you're doing is taking away a learning opportunity from yourself. And it's less yeah. though you need to put aside, where is my reputation going? Where is my sense of self going? And sort of put more trust in the idea that like, I could wake up tomorrow with more knowledge than I have right now if I am open to receiving this criticism. Yeah, and that's fundamentally a better place to be than just protecting whatever I think I've got here. Because if you're protecting your assumption, what are you doing differently than a study where you're trying to prove that uh, black people are worse than white people? The, like the, the, the goal is the same. It's I have an assumption and I'm going to prove it. Right, yeah. And it's not, I guess it's not literally the same, but it's like, if it's not literally what you're doing the same, is but protecting your belief in your way of life, then you're. It's not morally better or worse, but it is from a uh, logical standpoint. Uh huh, yeah. 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 All right. So I think we've, uh, we have solved racism here. <laughs> The I don't, two of us. I, let me just stop you there. I don't think we have, and I think we have a lot more work to do. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I've read one book. <laughs> I'll, so I know <laughs> that now that all I have to do is feel bad about books. myself. I have some books for you to read instead. Oh, it, it, it might be too late. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll just have to read more than one book then. What if I don't? Uh, what's that? What if I don't? <laughs> you're totally you're totally allowed to not also. You're absolutely allowed to not. But if a discussion ever veers in this direction and you say I don't want to get political, just understand that I might cut you out of my life. Like <laughs> <laughs> just All right. understand that like I am beginning to understand how someone can be beyond that being an acceptable thing for the people around them to say. Hmm. I don't want to get political. No, actually, you don't want to challenge any of your notions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But that's that, to me, is a different thing because I feel like... Um, and so this is a, the, the ska band that I play with, the, like... 
and it's it's not uh, strictly a ska band anymore at this point, but began life as a two tone ska cover band. Um, there's a, a song we do called Racist Friend by the Specials, and I know it was a controversial song, uh-huh. but basically it's like the chorus is, if you have a, a racist friend, now is the time, now is the time for your friendship to end. Uh-huh. And that's always one, like, I always feel like, but I don't know if I actually do engage people. I always feel like it's better to, like, challenge people, engage them than, than it is to just shut them out but i think that is maybe a case by case thing i think it's the muscle thing again where it's like a also also it's like literally um i feel like now when i think the words if you have a racist friend it's like it's the good bad dichotomy where it's like the question is if you have a racist friend and it's working from a right. flawed framework of like no but i do have racist friends or like, right. also it's like, you're racist. not, maybe it's best to say you're not a racist, but you are partaking in racism and you will sometimes do or say racist things. And maybe if it's easier for us uh, as white people to use this language and say like, maybe being racist isn't the def- Finding characteristic of you as a person. So I'm not going to say you're a racist, but it's like uh, uh, you may have you those did ten- you in that most scenario. likely have those tendencies and assumptions. Yeah. So it's like I think the question is less about whether or not it's time for your friendship to end if you have a racist friend and more. It's like I don't think it's that the solution is wrong. I think it's that the question is wrong. Conclusion, Ska sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all knew that before we even heard the song. <laughs> if you have a friend in a Ska band, it's time for your friendship to end. <laughs> oh, i got some uh, bad news for you. Uh, no, the specials are cool. I hadn't, re- I hadn't listened to them before. Uh, I this, haven't listened to them. They're good. The specials are good. I did wear a checkered uh, belt from West 49 for way longer than it was appropriate. <laughs> it's uh, grades seven to second year university. That's a, that is quite a stretch. It was too long. That's eight years. Yeah. 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 Not uh, bad. <laughs> it was much longer than the average teenage Scarface lasts. Oh man, so maybe you're just like like actually it's it's just like a form of like hating your ska roots. <laughs> it might be the case. It might be the case. Maybe I just am not on top of things enough to buy a belt. Yeah, there's a there's a good chance it's that. It's <laughs> like for me anyway, that's how that works. It's like if this one's working fine, I don't need a new one. That's why I don't get haircuts. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm always glad I did, but I like I really it needs it really needs to get to a point in order to make it happen. Uh-huh. Well, you have a good excuse not to right now. Yeah. Yeah, everything's weird and no one cares. Yeah. Cool. All right. I think we've cracked it. Uh well, no, I don't I don't think we've cracked <laughs> no, it, but yeah. Okay. I think I need correct. to uh I think I need to sign off. I also think that this is going to be impossible to edit. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> did a number on Mike. <laughs> or do you edit it and then send it to Micro for sound? Or? No, it's he's just been doing the whole thing, but um, there's I'm no... Sorry. Yeah, well, it's just not going to happen, I don't think. I think it's yeah. going to be on me. Yeah. But that's what I signed up for. Yeah, me too. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Yeah. Uh, James Brown, where can people find you online? I always forget to ask this question. Oh, I think on Twitter at, at James Brown. That's A.T. James Brown. Uh, oh. um, on Instagram at Bad James Brown. And I would say if you're going to, that's the one to go to because I'm starting to do Cooler Newell again. And that's probably I was going to say one. Cooler Newell has returned. I, will it just be a Friday thing or will it be back in I think, full I, force? I feel like it'll just happen sometimes. I remember I was doing it every day and stuff like that, but I feel like now it's like it can be a more nuanced occurrence. 
but it will right. be somewhat regular once again. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, I look Couple forward to it. I know, uh, I know, uh, um, people have, uh, I have been asked when it was coming back Well, <laughs> and I've got, I'm uh, just, I know I was, fans. I was informed recently that the Kiwi Junior Instagram page confused you with me and sent, uh, I was told they sent several uh, suggestions to live form response. That's who <laughs> asked me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I didn't know that that was the situation. Yeah. That's really funny. Yeah. So that mess- those messages were intended for me, but savor them. Um. <laughs> oh, I yeah. What did I say? Because I, I was like, um, my, I, I think that they, they, said, they asked me when Cooler Newell was coming back, and I think I responded that I don't know, but my voting thumbs are atrophying or something. <laughs> <laughs> so that would have just been confusing. <laughs> That's really funny. That's really funny. It's funny because I can imagine you in that scenario too, where it's like someone I sort of know and someone I like sort of like, but I don't know them well enough to be like, what? But I want to say something funny, but I want to, yeah. uh, it's perfect. Well, I just thought they were asking me because I had the inside info. I can't remember what prompted it. They assumed you had the absolute inside info. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's don't know. But yeah, so that's, so that's, I guess, bad. But aside from that, I don't know. Aside from that, my social media is it's good, but it's not that important. There are bigger things. JamesBrown.space, no longer a going concern. I tried to click on it earlier. I, uh, I still own the... Uh, the the domain domain and i have a wordpress site somewhere but i when i tried to map it to my wordpress site i guess it just didn't work and that was like nine months ago now figured my zero viewers wouldn't really care <laughs> no <laughs> that ship that ship has sailed for now yeah yeah i don't think the site that i don't update is needs to be that uh accessible but i should take the five minutes honestly oh maybe you could yeah but no at james if anyone wants to interact with me online at james brown or no it's sorry it's uh, <laughs> at james brown on twitter and it's bad james brown but the instagram is is with cool and all back that's where it should be bad james brown on insta that's what i would recommend yeah but i'm not much of a tweeter <laughs> yeah me neither well, this was good, though. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Seriously, for doing it. Thanks for uh, providing the... Uh, it's like it's good to do the book club thing because um, it was a good reason for me to finally get around to cracking this book. Totally. Me too. And I mean, yeah. that's... I guess we just need to do more of that, especially with larger circles and whatnot. Like, make learning not an entirely solitary endeavor. Yeah, exactly. And then it feels like there's a point, too. Yeah. All right. Did you make it? Are you still with me? This is maybe our longest episode ever. Uh, Maybe not longer than some of the um, After Dark shows we did, but longest straight podcast episode that we've done. Hopefully, I don't crash my podcast data plan. Uh, anyhow, if you would like to follow along for more such content, Bad James Brown on Instagram. Uh, I'm at, for purposes of this show, Learn Drums on Instagram, learndrums.ca. You send me feedback, you can message me on Instagram or uh, Ryan at learndrums.ca if you're an emailer. Very curious uh, to hear what people think of this episode and uh, whether it's helpful, whether it's totally egregious. I think we've established that uh, that we're, we're, we're pretty new to this territory, but I also feel like part of the, the problem is like when you don't know, you tiptoe around stuff. So it's like I definitely don't want to set out to, you know, hurt anyone but I also would like to be able to own my mistakes and be upfront about my own ignorance so anyway let me know what you think see you in two weeks oh also 
Uh, for those of you who may have uh, thought this was a slog, you'll be pleased to know that the next few episodes are already recorded. They are uh, being edited ahead of time. We will not have these kinds of technical hiccups, and they're good ones. I've got some cool surprises for you. All right, see you in two weeks. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.